burn? I like to eat the eyes first. Thanks for joining us at the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the works and worlds of Clive Barker, except today. Why did we open with a quote from Ernest P. Worrell? Uh, well, first, Happy Easter, and second, it's because this one time we took inspiration from Clive Barker's A through Z of horror and decided to talk about other things that we're fans of. We're betting you like other things besides Clive Barker, too. Let us know in the comments. Know what I mean? Hey, welcome to episode 139 of the No Clive Barker podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. So th- this uh, this week we're going to try something different. Um, we're not going to talk about any Clive Barker news or related subjects. We're going to talk about the stuff that we like apart from Clive Barker. Yeah. So it, actually, this kind of this idea kind of kicked off because we've been uh, we've been you know because of Clive Barker's A to Z of horror. It's like, well, if Clive Barker can talk about stuff that he likes, that's not Clive Barker stuff. Uh, maybe we can too. Yeah. So as usual, I'm Joe, and we got Ryan here with us. Hey. Hey. So in case you're this is your first time listening to our podcast, we do tend to nerd out and geek out a lot about Clive Barker, and I think this is going to be a different episode, and we'll see how that goes. Well, we've got 138 episodes about Clive Barker, so, <laughs> so, so um, you can uh, maybe bear with us a little <laughs> for this one where we're not going to yeah. talk. Yeah, you can get, learn. Get learn. to know. Yeah, get to know who the people are that you're supporting on Kickstarter and uh, and and helping us uh, d- do this fine podcast. So to, to start out with, I guess we could talk about music. Um, for me, I mean, I, people have probably seen me wearing the T-shirt in some of my pictures on Facebook and stuff, but I'm really, really into King Diamond and Merciful Fate. And people don't know, King Diamond was also the singer for Merciful Fate, and they broke up in, like, 1984, and then King Diamond went solo. And he does, like, um, if people don't know, there are these sort of operatic uh, horror-themed concept albums. Nice. I think I've listened to a couple of those. I'm not, again, we don't overlap a lot in music, I think. I mean, I'm not a huge, like, heavy metal fan. Um, I'm more into, like, punk music Mm. and, like, Detroit, Detroit music from the the 60s and 70s and stuff like that, like, stuff like MC5, um, the Stooges, Iggy Pop, Big in the Stooges, stuff like that. That's kind of, like, my my favorite music to listen to. But, uh, yeah, and... I also never really got a lot into uh, bands like Led Zeppelin or Black Sabbath. I mean, I got into it later as I got exposed to it, and I started delving a little deeper into that. Um, I know you're a big fan of that too, right? Uh, my wife really likes Led Zeppelin, and my mom did. Uh, I was uh-huh. I was more like Ozzy Osbourne, and, and I, you know, Black Sabbath. I first actually I got to use Black Sabbath as a as a as a a way in with my parents because my, you know, my mom was like, I don't want you. She found my Ozzy Osbourne tapes or whatever. And she uh-huh. said, I don't want you listening to that. So I'm like, Hey mom, you have black Sabbath albums. And she's like, she goes, so, and I'm like Ozzy Osbourne was the singer for that. And oh, I, just, wow. I had to show her, you know, on the, on the record album, like, look, it says right there, John Osbourne. She's like, that doesn't say Ozzy. Well, that's, <laughs> that's his real name. <laughs> So I guess that uh, so I, I, your mom I, never followed Ozzy Osbourne's solo career. No, no. Um, right. When there's this, when you have kids, you your music tastes just sort of freeze to the time when before you had kids. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So her her all of her music collecting stopped in 1974, and gotcha. uh, and didn't pick up again until I moved out of the house. She started singing yeah. like. I forget the names of these. She started getting into like new bands, and I'm terrible about pop music. Like I don't. Know. I think she said like Creed or some, but I don't know. She there's oh, some gosh, bands. Creed. Yeah, she, some bands that she liked, and I don't know even. I mean, wouldn't couldn't even identify any of their songs or anything. I think that may have something to do with this kind of theory that I have, and I think some people may think the same way. It's. I think your formative years kind of end. Sh- shortly before in your mid 20s or something that's yeah. when you kind of crystallize your personality and you're like this is stuff i like this is who i am yeah. and then you know maybe some people you know get a lot more stuff 
from around themselves. I mean, from from the culture that keeps going. But I think mostly you're pretty much set in your ways by the time you reach your 30s, and you're not going to change that much. So, um, yeah, did that happen to you too? After Joey got born, did you kind of stop listening to new music or? or I before that actually for me I I'm sort of stuck in the late 70s and early 80s. I, yeah. I mean I I buy new albums from 80s bands. So like I'll buy new Ozzy Osbourne, new Alice Cooper, you know. Sure. Um, with the exception of like I don't like what Metallica did. You know, after like I I would listen to Master when Master of Puppets came out. I would listen to that over and over, just keep on flip, flipping the tape over, you know, until sure. it wore it out. And mm -hmm. um, but then when Injustice for All came out, I would try to do that, and I'd keep falling asleep because the songs are like nine minutes long and they're kind of boring. And there was like, where's the bass guitar? And uh, I don't know. It just there. So that and that that was sort of a bridge, and then this, this black album came out. I thought, okay, well now it's going to get better, and I bought that, and I waited in line at the record store to buy that, and and it was for me just like super simple, sort of cheesy, repetitive uh, guitar, and like where what, what happened to the guitar solos? They didn't, they're not doing those anymore. And uh, they just sort of lost me, and I never, you know, I would always, I would always buy the new one, but I would just only listen to it the day that I got it, you know, and then I'll never listen to them again. Yeah, gosh, <clears throat> that happens to some bands. Sometimes they just change their, their style. <clears throat> and uh, I have to apologize because I got a, an enormous case of allergies right now, oh. <clears throat> so my voice may sound a little nasally, and I'm, I'm, I, I got a little bit of phlegm. I was cleaning a garage yesterday and uh, here in Arizona, and uh, <clears throat> I was sweeping a lot of dust. And uh, also, there's a lot of trees and flowers all around this place because it's close to, like, golf courses. So oh. being outside really gets me my allergies going. But anyway, I was going to say that uh, um, you, you spent some time in Japan, um, and I know that there's a, there's a lot of, like, metal bands that had a lot of Japanese reissues and remasters. Um, are, are, I know some people complain that, that some of those remasters sometimes are a little different and they don't like them. Do you have that experience? Did you, did you collect Japanese remasters or, uh, if not, uh, why not? Um, when I was in Japan, I, I, I got, there was a, a band called Seiki Matsu that I saw, I saw on a, like a TV commercial there. I'm like, who is that? Cause they, they. They were this metal band, and they wore costumes, so they were, for me, it's like, they look like a combination of Guar and King Diamond, like, you know, that wow. is awesome. So I had to go out and find them, and I bought all their albums and stuff. Um, they, they sort of, their face makeup is kind of more like Kiss, I suppose, um, and people in the U.S. say that they're a ripoff of Kiss, but they don't really sound anything like that. Uh -huh. And the guitarist, is, his name is Ace, which didn't help, I guess, but... Um, oh, like Ace Freely? Yeah, but he's Ace Shimizu. Okay. But yeah, um, but as far as like, um, what do you, what are they, the uh, remasters and stuff, I think I, yeah. I, I've heard of, I, heard, I didn't even know about that because I was there in 95. So I learned about that later, you know, when I came home and there was the internet and then I find out, hey, there's this Merciful Fate album that has an extra song on it if you get the Japanese version. Right, they you do know, that. Yeah, which which is kind of cool, and I you know, and then I started started I was buying you know Seiki Matsu albums through a catalog at my record store anyway. You know, for like sixty bucks, I would get a CD. Gosh, and yeah, it would, it, would, it would arrive in like two months. Um, so I think, but I think also I started using like LimeWire, and I would find a song, and then in iTunes I would stick it on the end of the album. And then, oh, I see. You know, and then I would basically have the. You make your own yeah. Japanese bonus track thing, yeah. yeah, the version. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, you know, I, I also like a lot of other stuff. I, uh, I like a lot of. Uh, maybe I don't know if other people know about this, but there's a band called the Fuzz Tones, which I, I'm a big fan of. Um, Is that a punk band? Yeah, it's kind of punkish. I would say more rock and roll. Um, has to do like uh, it's more like garage garage music covers and stuff like that. You know? 
Uh, but I like that a lot. And what else do I like? Uh, but but yeah, like some bands, like you said, sometimes they'll change their sound dramatically, and and it kind of loses you. And one of the guys who does that, and especially in his solo career, was Iggy Pop. I mean, he has a he has an album called uh, I think it was produced and uh, co-written with David Bowie. It was an album called Blah Blah Blah. Came out in the '80s. That was very like very different from what he was doing in his solo career at the time, and it became much more produced and much more like poppy, popsy and stuff because it, it had like David Bowie's production in there. Oh. And then he made another one called Instinct, which is just like a it, it's more like a metal kind of pop metal kind of album which is kind of weird because i think they had he had like uh some guitar players from um uh, i forgot the name of the guitar player but they were you know people from heavier bands that that joined to to play in that album and then he even made one recently called preliminaires which is basically just Ziggy pop singing song. french love songs Weird. And that one, yeah, that one completely lost me. I'm like, I have no idea what you're trying to do wow. here. <laughs> you know, uh, that's just weird. So, yeah, sometimes there's hits and misses. And, uh, it, it, it's I, a strange sort of a, it's a strange sort of a, a pressure that we put on these bands. Because, like, if you look at, for me, if you look at Metallica, I don't like the direction that they went where, you know, they, they got super popular, so they don't care what I think, but... You know, but then you look at Slayer, and their what they did was pretty much stay exactly the same. And I kind of got tired of. I love their old albums. I love all their stuff from the '80s. But you know, and once they got into the '90s, I sort of stopped listening to them. And I didn't, you know, none of their songs really, really sort of stuck with me. I guess in the same. Way. So I guess you're, 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 you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't, right? Because if you stay exactly the same, you know, then it's not that great either. Right, people just say, oh, it's more of the same, you know, this, we've heard all this before. But then if they do something too different, it's like, ah, I don't like this, what is this? Unless it's something groundbreaking, you know. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, um, there's some Japanese stuff. I, I, I'm not that much into Japanese stuff, to be honest. Maybe because the market isn't so widely available. But uh, I, I, I like Black Flag, I like Henry Rollins, and I think Henry Rollins... Um, was it Henry Rollins or Rob Zombies? I think it was Rob Zombie that did some uh, posts on Facebook with a group from Japan called Baby Metal. Oh, I don't know yeah. if you've heard of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like saying, these girls are kick-ass and they put more, more, uh, you know, uh, m more heart into their performances than I've ever seen before. And it's like, I just can't get into that stuff, though. It's, it's I, just a little I, too... I watched them on YouTube and I think, oh, it's kind of cool, but I don't know if I could, you know... Is that something I would want to listen to more than once, or is that just something that's kind of like, yeah, I'm going to watch the YouTube video? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like people really love that, um, you know, Pineapple Pen song or whatever, but if you would, I mean, you don't, they don't really think that's good, right? I mean, they don't really think that's a really great song. They just, look at this crazy thing I found on the internet. I just, I think I've heard of that song, but I haven't listened to it. Um... I know it went viral or something, the pineapple pen song, but I'm just I don't I don't do a lot of that uh, viral stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but the thing with music that I think is amazing is that although, for example, with movies, you don't really watch a same movie over and over, unless it's maybe Hellraiser or something like that. But uh, but for music, it's it's strange because I can listen to the same album like more than once in a single day, and I won't be bored with it if it's good music that I like. Whereas with a movie, I think you have, you know, sometimes some some albums are pretty long. They can be like over an hour long. Yeah. Especially if you're listening to prog rock. By the way, do you like prog rock? Um, I'm trying. I'm sorry, I'm super narrow minded. <laughs> I don't mean to be. Okay. Um, yeah. What, what, it, that's like electronic rock, right? Yeah, it's it, it's more like a uh, Rush, for example. Have you oh, ever heard yeah. of Rush? Okay. Yeah. 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 Like. They have long songs that go on forever, and there's, yeah. like, a big guitar solo, and there's, like, a lot of, you know, fantasy poetry in the middle and stuff like that. Like, 2112. Like, that's yes. a perfect, like, prog rock thing. And um, that album goes on forever. Like, the first side of the album, I think, is just one track. It's just one big, like, you know, uh, track divided in certain acts. And, you remember uh, uh, Matt Harple, who did our banner and stuff, and he was on our podcast. Yeah. He, he's, he's super into prog rock, and he... 
he got me, you know, he got me into into some like I was listening to Dream Theater for a while and Theater of Tragedy. I guess mm-hmm. those were prog rock bands. Um, sure, yeah, Dream Theater uh, always has these wonderful covers for their albums. Yeah. I think they're done by an artist called Dave McKean. It's a really cool artist. Yeah, and they had um, they had songs about like Hamlet. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, they, I but I I don't know. I just sort of sort of faded away from that and sort of kind of focused on my sure yeah. something that's a little more it has more power and speed. Yeah. Well, and plus, you know, I think as adults, we just don't have the time for music that we used to. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's right. Um, especially you know during work hours. I mean, some people are lucky enough. I know, for example, my my wife when she's working in the lab in the clean room, she can put on her earbuds and just work at the computer for hours. Oh, yeah. So she can listen to music. But if you're doing something that's more engaging or whatever, it, it's kind of hard to be able to listen to music while you're doing it. I can't do that. I mean, I, I, some people. My brother is like, I listen to music while I'm reading books, and I say to him. That's not possible. You know? Yeah, especially if it's got lyrics, right? Yeah, yeah. You are either tuning out the music and reading the book, or your eyes are scanning over the words and you're not really reading it and you're listening to the music. Right, right, right. And you're reading a Clive Barker book and all of a sudden you start reading that uh, we're going on the midnight crazy train. Oh no, it's <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne. He's looking yeah. into the, the, the story. Yeah. Actually, uh, Crazy Train came on at CrossFit um, on Tuesday of this week, and I, I was um, I just had to sing along with the whole song, and then I didn't make it through the whole workout. And she's like, you know, Ryan, if you just lower the weight on your on your push jerk, you could probably, you know, you could probably uh, make it through the end. And like, mm, or you, you don't play all the other. <laughs> so you're doing CrossFit? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's cool. I mean, I can only drone out when I'm reading if I'm listening to, like, ambient music or, or music that's just instrumental. Otherwise, yeah, I, yeah, like yeah. you said, I can't, I can't concentrate. Yeah, because my brain tries to... influences your mood, that's a little different from acting. Yeah, yeah. Like, I do that a lot when I'm reading, like, something. Like, when we were doing the episode for uh, a, a to Z, uh, the first episode... Like, I was reading the story of Ed Gein, and I was listening to, like, a horror playlist on Spotify. And I started getting freaked out because I was reading <laughs> yeah. that, like, one in the morning. Yeah. And the house was, like, all turned off and everything was, like – and I was like, oh, shucks. Did I close the garage door? Did I close the front door? Oh, no. I can't go downstairs and check. Ed Gein will get me. <laughs> yeah. You know? he, he And he's – that the, the look on his face, like, no remorse at all. Like, he's just kind of smiling and like, oh, you know, whatever, when he's getting put into the police car. Yeah. It, it's, that's so creepy. It's like he sure. has he has no concept that anything that he did was wrong. Right. I mean, I don't know the, I don't know the story of, like, how he really felt, obviously. But, it, you know, from the pictures and stuff, it sure didn't seem like he had any concept that, you know. I feel like I should uh, – I, I <laughs> one of the people that uh, all of a sudden popped in my mind thinking of Ed Gein, <laughs> and you're going to hate me for saying this, was uh, uh, Ernest P. Worrell. I guess I should Photoshop him in the, <laughs> in, in the photo, like doing some funny face and uh, just being arrested by the marshals. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm sorry, Vern. Okay. Well, uh, that, I – I guess that, that could, brings us, yeah, yeah, that could trans- transition us into the into the movies. Yes, I'm I'm a huge Ernest fan. Um, I think the, the the biggest reason is that his his weird like weird like non sequitur rants that you know I don't know who who writes those things, but they're amazing. It was a dark night in Lower Botswana. Giant bula bula flies droned in the still air. Then it came the screeching war cry of the Ottoman horde. <laughs> We're the Ottomans, and you're not. You're in a world of it now, pal. Oh, my. I'm afraid. Sure, I'm scared. Everybody in the box one is scared. It looks like curtains. This place is just screaming for Drake. Don't worry about the Ottomans. They're just wusses. They're all talk. I knew an Ottoman Eagle Scout. He got a merit badge in wholesale slaughter. Ah! Come on, Ottomans. Take a piece of me. <laughs> What we need is the high ground. The high ground is no good without trees. Red, Romans, Botswanians, 
Let me on free. There ain't no trade in Botswana. Uh-uh. I know. I am a Botswanian lumberjack, and I ain't never had a job. We need dress shield. You need the high ground to keep away from us. Cause, cause we're the ottoman. Ah! Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a few Ernest movies. Uh, um, the Halloween one, I think. And, uh... Isn't there one where he's like at a ski lodge or something? I forgot. There's I know a, there's a lot of those. There's Ernest goes to camp, Ernest goes to jail, Ernest scared stupid, Ernest rides again. Um, wow, Ernest son of in Ernest. The army. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think I've seen those movies when I was a kid, and mostly just on TV. When they were on TV, oh, yeah. I never saw any of those movies in the theater. Um, did you ever see any of those movies in the theater? Yes, I saw oh, cool. Ernest rides again in the theater. Which, oh, I see. which is weird because um, I've been listening to the Ernest podcast or the Ernest goes to podcast, and on one episode they're like, "Yeah, this was a direct to video movie," and I'm like, "No, I saw that with my brother in the theater." Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe it was a special screening, or was well, it I don't fully so. distributed? Yeah, I think it was. I mean, it was the first one where Disney sort of dumped the the uh, Disney Disney did the first four Ernest movies, and then they're like, "Yeah, we don't want to do this anymore," and and uh, they gave the rights back to. Um, to the, you know, the Cardin and Cherry, the people who did the TV commercials and stuff. So oh, Ernest okay. Rides Again was their first non-Disney Ernest movie. Okay. So it was, yeah. it, it, I don't know how limited the release was. I mean, I just went to a regular, like, AMC theater or whatever. I don't think that it was. I feel it was like, like 89, maybe 88, something like that. I feel like living in Portugal most of my life kind of, gave me different cultural references that Americans have. Um, for example, I mean, we I, we always get a lot more influence in terms of music and stuff from, like, uh, England and Great Britain and the oh, U.K. Yeah. We get more influence from that. I've, I've brought up bands and stuff that, for example, my wife and other American people that I talk to have never heard of, and they're enormous in Europe, you know, uh, bands like, uh, let me see if I can remember one. Um, Skunk and Anzi. They're 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 enormous in in, in <laughs> England and and uh, Europe, and I saw them live um, and everything. But uh, most people here never heard of Skunk and Anzi. They're just we don't know what that is. And, and yeah, we had a lot of we had a lot of English bands that came over, but I you know probably not you know not a huge percentage of them I guess. Yeah. But, uh, for example, other things I missed was uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse. I mean, I know it's a big deal for a lot of people here. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I just, I don't think I've ever seen a full episode of Pee Wee's Playhouse. Uh, well, I feel like I'm missing out. I was in high school, out. I think, when that came out. So, or, or like late junior high. And it was just, I, you know, it's like I'm not going to watch it. I, you know, I was trying to, you know, and I looked like a kid still, and I was trying to prove to everybody that I'm an adult. I'm like, I, I'm not going to watch some kid's show. So I never, right. yeah. It was the same with the Power Rangers. It's like, But uh, now it feels like uh, Ernest and Tim Burton movies and, like, Pee Wee Herman's Playhouse. They're all part of this kind of, like, little counterculture-y programming for kids that adults can also enjoy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But hey, I'm a big Star Wars fan. I mean, I, I oh, yeah. I've I've always been a big Star Wars fan. Uh more so until a few years ago. <laughs> oh. Because I don't know. Nowadays it just feels like once you go into a Target and you see Star Wars logos slapped on every single thing, even yeah. fruit, it kind of becomes a little you get burned out. You're like, "Okay, this is yeah. turning this is becoming lame." Because now there's Star Wars grapes and Star Wars apples. Yeah. And it's like there's no need for these things to be Star Wars. Yeah. But, you know, big licensing push. Well, uh, in our on our last episode, you had mentioned that um, uh, you thought General Grievous was a stupid name. And, and at the time I was thinking, I don't really know exactly where that came from, but I had always assumed that it was a title. Kind of like you've got Darth Tyrannus and Darth Sidious and Darth Vader and Darth Maul. I figured that that Sith, because they trained him, you know, to be like a Jedi. He says that you, uh -huh. I was trained in the Jedi arts that they gave him a title. So I, yeah. read, I read up on him, and it's not exactly true. He, but his real name is what I put in the notes there: Kwaimian Jai Shali Shilal. And he Damn. he changed his name to General Grievous after his wife got killed. 
I guess that's that's easier to remember. Yeah. So and he got in a he was in this huge accident or or battle or something, and he got had to turn into a cyborg like RoboCop. Oh, that's why he looks like mechanical. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I I'm a big Star Wars fan, but I'm not into the whole expanded universe thing like some people are, where they have all the novels and all the tie-in games and all that stuff. Yeah. I don't have any of that. I, I have don't, one. I don't either. I have one novel called Han Solo and the Legacy of Something Something. I forgot the, the rest of it. Is that the one with have, him and Chewbacca on the cover and it's like a blue paperback? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I had that's, that. That's the only one I ever had, and I had that when I was a kid. Oh, cool. Well, I got that one once at a book fair, and I just I, it was like a buck or something. I just bought it, and I was like, all right, I, I'll read it at some point. I read it when I was a kid, and I don't, but I don't remember anything about it anymore. Yeah, so it's it's funny that... That's the only book that you and I both have. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Completely unrelated, but a yeah. big coincidence there. It's interesting. Well, and a lot but, of people complain of, you know, the hardcore Star Wars fans complain about like, oh, now Disney's taken over, you know, all of the all of the other stuff that, you know, that used to be canon isn't canon anymore. All the expanded universe and they blame Disney, but George Lucas did that when he made uh when he first did um when he first did what uh the the first prequel, um, yeah, Phantom Menace. The, the Phantom Menace. He he actually, told, you know, there were books that contradicted what happened in the Phantom Menace, and he's like, "Oh yeah, well that's not canon anymore." Oh, and okay, people I got see. mad back then, but because it was like, you know, what was that George 99? Lucas? So it was like eighteen years ago. You know, people have forgotten already. Sure, they, sure. You know, they want to blame Disney because Disney is a giant corporation and they make, you know, little kids things and it's really easy to get upset with them. But I, I think that they're, you know, they, they said that the uh, expanded universe was not something they were going to use. I, I'm not entirely sure they discarded everything because I feel like they're they're still getting like characters that are from um, certain certain references in the movies and like the yeah. Clone War um, cartoon yeah. And stuff like Forrest Whitaker's character in the last Star Wars film, Rogue One, he's he came from the cartoon show. Yeah, well, the cartoon show was canon. I mean, everything everything that happened. Right, right, of course. Yeah, between the Phantom Menace and now is supposed to be you know all the novels and everything. I, as far from what I know, are, are supposed to be canon. I have a transfer from a thirty six millimeter uh, print of the original Star Wars. That I don't even know how this stuff happened, but there was a, a team because there's a lot of um, there's a website called OriginalTrilogy.com, and there's a lot of people there who devote their free time to finding versions of Star Wars out there or restoring it mm -hmm. and putting it up for other collectors uh, as kind of a preservation project kind of thing. Yeah. So there was a team called Team Negative One, and they found. Uh, a print, a 36 millimeter print, or a, a, a 35, 35 or 36, I forgot. Um, 35, I think. Pro, yeah, 35, I think. So, and they found a, a print of that, and they scanned it and color corrected it, and kind of like mm. you know preserved it, and, and and did the best they could to make it um, look good. And they they remixed the audio as well. They remastered it, and they put it out. And I have it. It's like 24 gigabytes. Jeez. It's an enormous file, but I managed to, to get a copy of that once, and I saw it on my TV, and I was like, yep, this is just like being in the theater because, you know, it's it's just how it was like in 77. There, there uh, was one set of Star Wars uh, DVDs that had the uh, that had the, the original versions, but people were kind of upset that they weren't anamorphic widescreen, so I guess... Yeah, they were the laser disc transfer. Is that what they were? Yeah, they, so they, they were the old laser disc transfers. So they, they had the um, the bars on them. Yeah, they had the bars on top and bottom. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I mean, if you put it on a, a a sixteen by nine TV, you would get bars on the sides yeah. as well as the bars on the top and bottom. So you just have like about half of your screen. Well, maybe a little more than half, but the the image would be small, and yeah. you wouldn't be using the whole a screen, which doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but. Yeah, that's why people were always complaining about that, and they wanted to have you know the the original unaltered movie trilogy 
Which I think it's coming out at some point. I think they might have put it out. Yeah, they're more sensitive form. to the what the fans want instead of like George Lucas going, "No, I, this is the movies now," because he's not since he's not in charge anymore. Yeah, not just that, but at one point he said that they had actually altered the original negatives uh, when they were remaking the special editions, and so that there's no original version that they could put out anymore. Oh, wow. Which I, I think it's not Sorry. true. I think it was just a way for him to like shut the. The people who were asking for the original unaltered trilogy, but you know, mm. that's we'll see about that. I'm sure in the future that that stuff is eventually going to come out. Star Wars was the first, actually, the second movie I ever saw um, in the theater. Oh, nice. Yeah, the, the first one was Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, uh, and then and then the second one was was Star Wars, which you know, in on the oh, hardcore Star Wars fans are always calling it a New Hope, and it, for me, I just can't do it. You know, it's I, it's just Star Wars to me. I don't remember exactly what the first movie I saw in a movie theater might have been, but I do remember the earliest one that I remember was E.T. when it came out in the theaters. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I remember seeing E.T., and I remember crying my eyes out when E.T., you know, looks like he's dead, and then the little kid, Elliot, hugs him, and the, the potted plant comes back to life. Right, <laughs> E- 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 oh my god E.T. and Ghostbusters were uh, two movies both that I saw uh, trailers for on TV and I thought they were horror movies oh because well E.T. started out the treatment was supposed to be um, a Dark Skies or something like that the title was, was supposed wow. to be different and they were supposed to be four aliens one of them was supposed to be evil and the E.T. one was – they all had names, I think. Oh, I have wow. the treatment for this. Jeez. I have the treatment for this. I need to find out where I put that thing because that would be a great thing to send you. And there's even, like, sketches of the aliens that were done by uh, Rick Baker, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So it was going to be a very different – it was going to be more about abducting, alien abduction. Well, the trailer had E.T. like running through the grass and you couldn't see him. So it's like something skittering in through the grass towards you. Uh-huh. And uh, so that they made it look like a horror movie. And then, of course, Ghostbusters, you know, it did have some sort of horror elements to it or just like spooky, scary, you know. Yeah, the library lady. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that, I that, found that was, uh, a, that was a tense scene. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, there's a lot of stuff in uh, Ghostbusters that even if you're a kid, I think on the second one, they kind of hit that mark where they mixed comedy with scary stuff, with ghost stuff, uh, really right, where it's like... Even if you're a kid, and I was a kid when I saw Ghostbusters, um, it doesn't scare you. I mean, it, it kind of spooks you a little bit, but yeah. it doesn't make you, like, afraid like when I saw Nightmare on Elm Street for the first time. Right, yeah. And, yeah, and I was uh, like, I can't I can't leave my arm outside the bed or Freddy's going to reach out from under the bed and scratch me. <laughs> yeah. That messed me up. Nightmare on Elm Street kind of messed me up for like a year or so. The, I was afraid. The what messed me up when I was a kid was uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, like the last scene? Yeah, I could, I could, I couldn't handle being in caves and having arrows shooting at people or getting squished by a big rolling boulder or you know people's faces melting off. That's pretty. I mean, that was it before is. that was before there was such a thing as PG thirteen. So it was just you know PG regular PG movie. Yeah, well, nowadays when you look at the Indiana Jones movies, uh, looking at them through the lens of today's sanitized movies for, you know, the same demographic, mm. um, Indiana Jones has a big body count in those movies. Yeah. He kills a lot of people. I, uh, yeah. Today he would probably just – he wouldn't, like, punch a Nazi and he would fall off the tank, but he wouldn't be, like, crushed by the, the tank uh, behind him, I guess. Yeah, he would just see, right. see the guy, like, rolling around the dirt and just getting dirty and stuff. Yeah, you think he would kind of take a look at his life choices and think, you know, I uh, I don't know if it's worth murdering all these people just so I can put things in a museum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing that I never really got that much into until much later in life when I was, like, in my late 20s, maybe early 30s, was kaiju movies, especially Godzilla, which I know you're a big fan of. Oh, yeah. Well, and um, when I was living in Japan, we had a, um, I was in Kobe in 1995, and there was a, I mean, there was a big earthquake, and it's, 
not quite like the one now that that wrecked the uh, nuclear power plant, but it was huge. I mean, I and and I was there in Kobe in the middle of this. This it was like seven point two earthquake. It killed six thousand people. That's and, horrible. And um, was there a tsunami? Um, I think yes. I think there was in in Kobe. Okay. But I and I was far enough inland. I was in a dorm building because I was going to college there, and my dorm building swayed, you know, like a tree mm-hmm. in the wind, kind of. So yeah. I remember being woken up by that and and uh, trying to put on my pants, and I kept falling over because the you know the earthquake and and uh, but but after talking to everybody, um, and and I had been you know and we I, we had just finished doing a, a unit on Godzilla in this Japanese cinema class that I was taking. And um, and I remember talking to everybody that I talked to after the earthquake. They had all had a dream about Godzilla, and I did too. And and I remember thinking, you know, and, and, and I was always interested in sort of Jungian psychology and the collective unconscious and stuff. And I started thinking about, I wonder if in Japan, you know, Godzilla is part of a collective unconscious. So I started really getting into Godzilla and, and um, I started, I, I got, I bought a, a, a VCR from the garbage man cause he, uh-huh. there was a local garbage man that was a, you know, a white guy. He was an American an yeah. expatriate that he would just collect things that, cause Japanese people, whenever they bought something new, they would throw the old thing in the garbage. Oh. So I bought he he sold VCRs and he sold all kinds of stuff electronics and stuff. So I bought a second VCR and I just started dubbing mm-hmm. Godzilla movies to bring back home. Yeah. Oh, right. Not yeah. dubbing the voice dubbing, but uh, duplicating. Yeah. Du- yeah. Duplicating. The, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, Godzilla yeah. movies to bring back. I mean, eventually I've replaced them all with with subtitled versions of the movies instead of you know dvds and blue now blu-rays yeah Yeah, so you can listen to the original versions uh, of the movies not the dubbed ones but sometimes the dubbing was was just done very very poorly (laughs) there are some um the like godzilla raids again where the dubbing the people are trying to imitate japanese accents and it just sounds just horribly racist oh god yeah yeah Yeah. Uh uh-huh yeah, and like, I know uh, people like there. There's a whole uh, there's there's a whole faction of Godzilla fans that they what they like about it is just watching the the dubbing so they can make fun of it. And it's yeah, like, because it's definitely it, it makes it much more yeah. cheesy and funny. Yeah, but I mean, I when I lived in Japan, I saw lots of movies dubbed in Japanese that were American, and they were stupid too. You know, like I saw <laughs> I saw Predator with with Arnold Schwarzenegger dubbed in Japanese, and it was ridiculous. You know, you could yeah, s- sometimes they have uh, voice actors that kind of stay on that particular actor for most of their career. Like yeah. there will be a, a voice actor to dub Schwarzenegger in the cinema, for example. Yeah. And, and it'll, he'll do mostly all of those movies that Schwarzenegger does. Yeah. So people kind of identify that voice with the actor. It's It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine you probably saw a lot of that, too, in Portugal. Um, well, here we don't really dub movies. We use subtitles for wow. most things, even on TV. But in but in um, Italy, then they don't they dub everything. Oh yeah, Italy, Spain, Germany, France, they dub everything. Huh. Uh, but but in Portugal, we don't really have that culture of dubbing things, so that kind of helps us be more in touch with other languages. That's cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, they do dub children's cartoons, so yeah, obviously yeah. Cause because it's too too hard to read that fast. Yeah, they dub that. I mean, every Disney movie that hits Portugal, there's usually like a multiplex always has like uh, uh, two two uh, theaters where it's playing the uh, dubbed version and then one of them with subtitles. Oh, so wow. if you want to watch Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs in the original version, you always have that option to go see it um, in English uh, with subtitles. But yeah, but so we don't really have that. But for example, the first time I saw... Uh, another Schwarzenegger film was Terminator 2. It, it, it was coming out. Um, I hadn't seen it on the theater, but my brother was in this uh, video store, and the guy from the video store said, hey, I, I got a copy uh, of the rental version of Terminator 2 uh, from Spain. It hasn't hit Portugal yet. Do you guys want to watch it? And we're like, yeah, sure. I'd love to watch that movie. I missed it on the theater. 
Mm. And it, it was just a few months ago, and, and, you know, I saw it. But this version from the video store that he bought from Spain was dubbed in Spanish. No. And so one of the things that I thought was really strange was at the end of the movie, and I, I thought this was, like, what the last line was for the longest time until I actually saw the American version, was in, in uh, Schwarzenegger, when he shoots the T-1000, instead of saying, hasta la vista, baby, he says, sayonara, baby. <laughs> because it was dubbed in Spanish, so they figured they would just use a different kind of expression because hasta la vista, baby was already Spanish. And so they said, sayonara, baby. And for a long time, I thought that was what Schwarzenegger was supposed to say to the oh, T-1000. Wow. And then I saw the American version uh, like a few months later. Uh, and I was like, oh, he says hasta la vista, baby instead of sayonara. So that's the kind of dubbing that I really don't like is dubbing that – changes things yeah changes the original meaning because they feel like oh our audiences won't understand this joke or this pun or whatever we'll just make up something else and dub it over and i think that uh, that's just wrong <laughs> i know and sometimes they, jokes don't translate but well and they do it a lot just to make the the length of the sentences match or the or the lip reading sort of match yeah so there'll be yeah. weird pauses like mid-sentence and stuff and and change the meeting, the, like Godzilla 2000, I think I saw that one dubbed originally first before I saw it with subtitles. Because they didn't, I think it, it came out originally without subtitles. And they were like, there was one thing where he, they were talking about this drill missile that would that would go through Godzilla. And he's like, that'll shoot through Godzilla like crap through a goose. Oh my god, really? Yeah, it's like, where did, who came up with that? Yeah. Well, for example, the first Godzilla, they even had Raymond Burr show up. Yeah. And they re-edited the film, and they shot new footage to put it in there. Yeah. Which doesn't have anything to do with the original movie. So. And they did they're... it again in uh, Godzilla 1985. Oh, okay. They, they they brought Raymond Burr back and everything. Oh, all right. I, I guess I missed that one. I know that there's like 30-something movies of Godzilla at this yeah. point. Yeah. Right. And in Japan, Did you see the last Godzilla one? 1984. Um, yeah, re, um, uh, Godzilla Shin Shin Gojira, and, and it, Shin Gojira. They, they, yeah. yeah, they were originally going to call it like in the in America they were going to call it Godzilla Resurgence, but uh -huh. I don't know if that title you know is going to go on anything anymore now because in the theaters it was they just gave it the Japanese title. Yeah, Shin Godzilla. That was on the theater when yeah. I saw it. I saw it in this real cool like. Art House Theater here in Phoenix. Yeah. <clears throat> Very nice. Got a nice mural outside of it and everything. Um, but it, it, it was a little weird, especially the uh, the time that Godzilla shows up first for the first yeah. time in the movie. And he's, like, transforming into – he's, like, mutating or something. Yeah. I purposely there, didn't watch any trailers or anything so that I could, you know, see it fresh. And I'm like, is that him or is that a different monster that he's going right. to fight later? Because he appears all bug-eyed and he's like, you know, uh, releasing all this blood from his body and stuff. Yeah. So he was just mutating. I yeah. thought that was cool, though, because if Godzilla was caused by radiation, yeah, sure, he would probably mutate. Um, so that made sense. But the, that Shin Gajira ended up being more about bureaucracy and how the government was going to handle that if it was a real monster that showed up, more so than the Godzilla fights. So I thought in that regard, the story – Kind of lost me a little bit because it was a little boring. It was a lot of guys in like offices just talking about what to do. It, it was. Uh, I think it, they they wanted to sort of tie together the Fukushima accident and Godzilla and and earthquake and and disaster relief and and um, for me, it almost felt like they had made that movie just for me. You know, just, <laughs> okay. just because of that. I mean, I you know having been through you know a big natural disaster earthquake in japan and thinking sure. about godzilla at the time i was like i couldn't i couldn't believe it you know for me that that's my favorite godzilla movie of all of them now oh oh awesome awesome yeah no it was fun i thought they really did a good job with the monster when he finally reaches his final form and yeah. it looked really nice um the, I, it, I don't think there's going to be a sequel even though you know the ending sort of was a cliffhanger uh-huh I think that it was, it, you know, and it was also one of the best-selling Godzilla movies that they've had in Japan, anyway. I mean, it had a sure. real limited, super limited release in the United States, but, um, but I think that they're still, you know, I don't know. There's the next one is going to be animated. Uh, the next oh, Godzilla that, movie that would be great. You mean like CGI? 
No, like a cartoon. Oh, speaking of cartoon, do you remember the old Godzilla cartoon with Godzuki? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I used that was to, awesome. I, I used to watch that, and I had the um, I had the the toy, the um, the, the ship. Uh, or the no, Godzilla. The, the Godzilla that you know you push a button and his tongue would stick out, and you you could launch his fists and you know at people for some reason. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, and uh, I, I, yeah, I remember that. I was like, uh, like maybe seven or eight, and I would go home after school and I'd, I'd watch that that show. I'd be like Godzilla yeah. and Godzuki, yeah. and it was just hilarious. That thing is, yeah, it was I, funny. I, yeah. I, I watched that at the time. That was like seventy nine. That that cartoon came out and then i watched it again because they, they put it on netflix so i watched it again a couple of years ago and mm-hmm. like, i didn't realize how much they abused they're they're like a really bad patient at a hospital because they had this godzilla call button that they would push for every little thing that that happened yes. in their lives they're just like oh we better get godzilla but which is stupid because what godzilla is swimming under that boat all the time just yeah. waiting to be called yeah yeah you think yeah. you would get fed up with them and then just step on their <laughs> yeah, or pick up their boat like he did all the time and just drop it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I like Godzilla now. I I I really grown into it, and 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 I've kind of spanned out into other kaiju films like Gamera. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Big uh, Turtle one. The the uh, the Heisei God's, God, Gamera movies are awesome. The the ones from um, the nineties. Mm-hmm. The, the there's a trilo- that trilogy of them. Uh, one, two, and three are really good. Okay. I have them on Blu-ray. Yeah, yeah, and the the original ones I kind of like, but they're they're weird and it's a little disturbing. There's a lot of like horrific violence to these, you know, to Gamera and and his enemies and stuff, like chopping them up into little pieces, and then yeah. little, little kids are like dancing and and laughing and stuff. <laughs> and there was a, a a character that was created after some sort of competition with Toho. It was called Jet Jaguar. Right. And I think he was created by, like, a kid that sent in, like, a design, and they turned it into a real character. Yeah, he, he – um, uh, and a kid controlled him, and that was the Megalon movie, Godzilla vs. Yeah. Megalon. Yeah. Um, so Clyde Barker was kind of like the guy who pulled me into, like, horror movies because before I watched Hellraiser, I think I had only seen at that point maybe, like, Nightmare on Elm Street and um, Halloween – Halloween one or oh, wow. Halloween one and two, maybe. Yeah. So I wasn't really a big horror fan. And then I saw Hellraiser and, and I still am a little reluctant to call Hellraiser kind of a horror film. Uh, although, you know, it is what it is. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's horror, but it, it didn't scare me. Like I was more fascinated with the Cenobites than I was scared of like, say Freddy Krueger, you know, I think, Part, except for the ending, I think a part of it is that the monsters aren't the bad guys. So, right? Yeah, the, I mean, like Julia is really the you know is really the 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 evil queen. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, she's luring these. I mean, but there it, it's weird because there's no there's no characters really that die except for maybe Larry that you feel really really bad for. But you, sure. don't, you don't even see when Larry got killed. It all just happened, and you f- you find out Off about screen. it. Yeah, and you find out about it when Kirsty finds out about it. Yeah, and well, of course, there's always the guys that Julia kills with a hammer as well. Yeah, but you don't really care that much about them because they're just you know they're just these lonely kind of people. Some of them are jerks. Yeah, and they just show up on screen for maybe less than a minute. Yeah, so you you don't really connect to them at all. Yeah. But then I got, I started getting more into, you know, like more like uh, horror movies and stuff. And especially, I think my decade, my favorite decade for that sort of movies is like the 90s. Just because there were so many cool things happening in the 90s. And nowadays you go and you open up an old Fangoria magazine or something. Yeah. And you hear about all these awesome films that were coming out at the time. Uh, like... Uh, Movies that nowadays wouldn't be made, you know, because just nobody would want to put money into it, like uh, Ice Cream Man. Uh, I, I don't know that one. Uh, Ice Cream Man is done with that uh, brother, that guy whose brother's, um, he's Ron Howard's brother. I forgot his name. Uh, let me see if I can, let me see if I can find that real quick. 
But there's just so many movies that when you go to those old magazines and you look it up, you know, there there's so many weird things happening back then, like, you know, Wishmaster, um, uh, Ice Cream Man, uh, all these like weird sci-fi horror movies that were coming out in the 90s. It was just like the golden age of like, you know, monster makeup. And I, I just I just love all those movies. They're just really, really awesome. So Ice Cream Man is a monster? Well, it's a horror movie. Uh, it's with Clint Howard. Huh. And uh, he, he plays an ice cream man that kills people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah. Like, one of the promo pictures is just him, like, going like, shh. And then he's holding a giant waffle cone, and there's someone's head stuck on it. Jeez. <laughs> so did <laughs> and he kill little kids? No, he killed guys, like, you know, adults. But, uh, yeah, I haven't seen that movie, actually. I, I need say, to. That sounds like a horror movie for parents. Yeah. I haven't seen that movie in a long time, so I need to um, I need to watch that movie again. But it's just so weird. And it's like nowadays they wouldn't be able to make it. It's, uh, it's this guy. After being released from the Wishing Well Sanatorium, um, Clint Howard's character. Let me see if I can read the, the synopsis on this. Yeah, after being released from the Wishing Well Sanatorium, all he wants to do is make the children happy. So Gregory opens, reopens the old ice cream factory, and all the unappreciative brats are reprocessed into the flavor of the day. Whoa. So, yeah, he just, he, it's, he just kills everybody. <laughs> um, and it's, it's just Clint Howard is so creepy in this movie. It's just wow. it, it's hilarious. I don't know if anybody out there has seen Ice Cream Man. If you have, just let me know what you thought of the movie because i, I got to find that movie again and rewatch it. I think I, I, I really like the 90s Godzilla and Gamera movies, but I don't – trying to think of 90s – I liked uh, Lord of Illusions a lot, of course, even though we're not talking about Clive Barker. Right. Um, trying to think what about of, horror? Yeah, I'm trying to think of horror. I liked Alien 3, I guess, which okay. is my 90s horror movie that I like. I saw that one in the theater, um, which I, I, a lot of people probably would say I saw an inferior version in the theater because it was a theatrical one. I still oh, yeah. thought it was okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I saw it I in the theater, too. And, uh, oh, The Crow, is that a horror movie or an action? I don't know what that is. but Yeah, it's it's hard, right? I mean, I yeah. would call it kind of like a dark, dark yeah. fantasy movie. Yeah. Candyman, of course. Um, what else is... Uh, oh, L Land of the Dead? No, that was in the 2000s, I think. Yeah. That wasn't in... Uh, what about... I think Blade was in the 90s. Yeah, Blade. Oh, my God. I, I Blade 2. Yeah, I, Blade 2, I don't know if I liked quite as much, but I liked bl the first one. Is the Blade 2, I think, the one where he walks into, like, an, a vampire nightclub, and all of a sudden... Uh, they start. There's a sprinkler system on the top of the nightclub, and it starts spraying blood that's, all that's over the, the people. First one. Oh, that's the first one. Yeah, yeah that the scene is like, just that scene is worth the price of admission. The second one was the Guillermo del Toro one, where there were vampires that eat vampires. Yeah, that opened up their lower jaw and yeah. split it in two. Yeah. yeah. And then there was there's, a third one that was PG-13, where he, Ryan fought, Reynolds. he fought Dracula or something. Yeah, that's just. Yeah, that's. That's just not not as good. No. But uh, are you into zombie movies? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I loved. Actually, the first zombie movie that I really got excited about was Night of the Living Dead 1990 remake, which is kind of weird. But I think, well, obviously, I wasn't even born when the black and white one came out, and I wasn't really into black and white movies. But sure. But uh, yeah, it's um, directed by. Uh, Oh, gosh, the special effects guy, Tom Savini, directed the Night of the Living Dead 1990 remake. Oh, is that the one that has, like, the biker gang show up at the mall? That's Dawn of the Dead. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So it's the, the in the farmhouse. Um, oh, it, yeah. What, yeah, yeah like, they're Tony coming to get Todd you, Barbara. And, yeah, but the, the remake has Tony Todd as, as Ben, and it has... Um, Patricia Talman as Barbara, and so you got more of a sort of a kick-ass Barbara instead of the hysterical one that faints all the time. You know, I don't think I've seen that movie. I think I've seen the black and white one oh, several okay. times, but I don't think I've seen that one. So now I'm thinking I probably should try to find a copy of that. Yeah, it's really good. Actually, and, and actually, Barbara survives through it, which is pretty cool. I mean, instead okay. of just going nuts and 
fainting on the couch and then getting, you know, grabbed by her brother and taken away. She is kind of a useless character. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I guess it's a product of the times, I suppose. I don't know. Sure. And, um, what was it? Uh, so that, that got me into zombie movies and I started, um, with my Dungeons and Dragons group, which, you know, we would always rent movies and play Dungeons and Dragons and, I would always want to get zombie movies, and I was getting disappointed by a lot of them, you know, but the ones that I loved that, that I would always find that I liked were the George Romero ones, so Dawn of the Dead, Land, uh, Day of the Dead. Um, Day of the Dead is the one that has Bub, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's in, my favorite one. In that underground bunker. Yeah. What have you been doing, Frankenstein? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, and, that bad guy, he's so over-the-top crazy. Yeah, yeah. But he's believable. You can kind of see how he got there. His his death scene is awesome when oh, he's yeah. like being eaten by Joke the zombies. Choke on them. Choke on them. And you know what? I've heard uh, from, I think either from a, a commentary track or a behind the scenes making of documentary, that those guts were real guts that they had in the freezer or the fridge. But somehow... Uh, there was like a blackout or something, and I, I think I, they said that the the guts kind of got a little rotted. Yeah. And it was like the weekend, so they couldn't get a replacement, so they used those anyway. And it was just like horrible stench while they were shooting that scene, and everybody was gagging. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's just horrible. So it made his performance more believable. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I, I that, that scene where they um, – I think is it Miguel – uh, the the guy that that goes the, that's like her boyfriend and he kind of goes nuts and uh -huh. he, he gets bitten on the arm by a zombie and she well, that scene where she she chops off his arm and cauterizes it looks so real there's a lot yeah of, great great special effects there yeah yeah there's a lot to be said for practical effects like that you know they can yeah, sometimes it seems like CGI can be lazy, and in the old days, the, the beginning days of CGI, it was so expensive that they would only use it super sparingly. Mm -hmm. But now it's like a shortcut. It's yeah, I, I you know on TV and, and TV shows and stuff like that, they use so much CGI that people don't even realize. Like yeah. when they're showing, like uh, like like a show like The Wire or something, or a show that, that puts characters talking on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. That's all going to be done in CGI because they're not going to spend money uh, with the production traveling to Washington and shooting a scene there. So they're just going to put them all on the green screen and, like, CGI the Lincoln Memorial behind them. And most people don't even realize that it's uh, CGI. There was a, um, a, a video reel that I saw once that showed a lot of these TV shows like CSI, and a lot of those scenes, you look at them and you think, that's got to be a location shot. But then, no, they just disassemble it and you see you see the little wireframe models in the background and then they just peel it out bit by bit and they show you just the characters on a green screen. Yeah. And you're like, huh, we'll all be damned. That's the, new, uh, the new matte painting, I guess. Yeah, that is the new matte painting. I think they call it digital matte painting now. So, oh, wow. Yeah. I'm a big fan of, of George Romero's films. But I haven't really gotten into those last ones. I think uh, the one with Dennis Hopper and John Leguizamo, uh, City of the Dead, L Land of the Dead, Land of the Dead. Yeah, and it has that uh, that that huge uh, that huge like siege car called Dead Reckoning. Yeah, I think that was the last one that I actually liked. Yeah. Although the whole premise is a little weird, and I I think there was an evolution throughout the Romero movies where he tries to make. The zombies, uh, he tries to turn the zombies into like, well, the zombies are actually getting smarter now yeah. and they can communicate with each other and they're organizing. And basically they're the new society because they're the majority, yeah. you know, and they, there's that big, you know, mechanic, the mechanical zombie guy, the the big black guy, Big Daddy or whatever his name was. Oh, yeah. Like he becomes like a leader to the zombie faction and he's like strategizing and saying you let's go under the river and let's yeah. go invade the so yeah but then he just made another one called like diary of the dead or something and the, yeah, I didn't it's like just that. weird i didn't like diary of the dead that much i have it but i only watched it the one time when i first got it and i was like kind of like i don't know it was like a found footage it just looked too cheap yeah, it's, it's a found footage but it's got like a soundtrack and i think at one point yeah. the character says something like well i just put this music on to make it more interesting and it's like are you kidding me yeah. <laughs> that's 
that's not how you do like a found footage film. No, yeah, and and there were there were times when it forgets that it's a found footage movie, which kind of you know like the camera angles you know change sure. or whatever, and in you you know it's like oh there's a second camera all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, that's not. Yeah. I'm a big uh, fan also of the Evil Dead uh, movies. Yeah, yeah, oh, I love yeah. those. Yeah, they're just great. And there's so many versions of that. Um, yeah. I think the original version was like this student film that was made by Sam Raimi. It was called uh, Into, the, Into Woods the Woods or something. Yeah, yeah I saw that. It's it's You can see definitely the, the birth of this whole story there. Yeah, yeah. well, and even Evil Dead 2 is like a remake of the first movie. That's true, yeah. <laughs> and, then of course there's the, the 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 one where he goes into the past and uh Yeah. That's that's just so much fun. Yeah. And and the the European ending was the um the one where he drank he he had too many drops. Yeah. And and he he woke up in a in the in like Armageddon future. Yeah, he comes out with a giant beard and is like, "Oh no, I, I drank too long." <laughs> yeah, it's such a long. That's funny. I I yeah. think that should be that should be the the ending of the movie, as far as I'm concerned, because yeah. that would just be a perfect like setup for another sequel. Yeah, yeah, and um, but the other ending, the, the the American ending, was cool too. I you know I don't I I like them both, but I think that they had to go with the American ending for the continuing on with the TV series that's on now. Ash versus I haven't Marvel. seen it. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Is it have, good? I don't have cable, so I just have been buying the Blu-rays, and so I have season one and two, I think. All right, so do you recommend that? Yeah, yeah, it's really good. Awesome. I, I like uh, Bruce Campbell a lot. I think the last TV show I saw him in was, um, was it Burn Notice? I think it was oh, Burn Notice. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because he, he, yeah. Matt Harpold went to a, um, a signing of his one time for, I think it was for Briscoe County Jr., uh-huh. He, he he had he he got up to the front of the line and he goes say the line and Bruce Campbell's like hey I'm here for Briscoe County Junior and Matt goes say it and he goes groovy uh, groovy <laughs> that's funny uh, there was one movie with Bruce Campbell that I didn't think was that good though let me see if I can remember what it was it was a he plays himself he plays the actor Bruce Campbell he lives in a trailer yeah um oh gosh what was that like. Bruce Campbell versus some, or I can't remember what it was. I he fights a, an Asian like deity called Quanji. Yeah. He's like the the god of tofu or something. I'm trying to remember what yeah. what it's called. Um, let's well, see. My name is Bruce. My name is Bruce. There we go. Yeah, and he his character is similar in the Ash versus Evil Dead. His character is kind of similar to that because he's living in a trailer. In. So did you see My Name is Bruce? Yeah, yeah, I did. The I, ending is such a cop-out. Yeah. I, I thought the ending was a cop-out. I was like, oh, okay, well, the movie's actually fun. And then it get, gets to the third act, and it just comes apart and just kind of becomes super self-aware. Yeah. And it doesn't even have an ending. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I guess I didn't see that coming. So I was a little disappointed. A lot of people really like Bubba Hotep also. And, oh, and God, yeah. I didn't. I didn't get it. I mean, I thought it was really, I thought it was just really strange. Oh, you didn't get it? I, I just thought it was the whole, the whole idea was funny. as like a, yeah. a mummy that sucks the souls out of like senior citizens through their buttholes. And it's so weird. And then one guy says he's JFK and, you know. And he's he's goes, black. Yeah. And then. Well, just, they put his body, they, they put his body, uh, brain into a different body. That's, uh, that's his theory. Oh. Yeah. And then that uh, Bruce Campbell's character is really Elvis. Uh, he yeah. swapped places with like a body double because he was tired of being Elvis and he wanted to lay low for a while. And yeah. then Elvis died. That's really strange. It yeah. is strange, but it's funny, I think. It's made by the same guy who did the Phantasm films, right? right? Don Coscarelli. And actually, yeah. I've been meaning to give that movie a second chance because I just watched a Don Coscarelli movie. Was it John Dies at the End? Have you seen that one? Uh, no, I haven't. It, that movie is, you know, I thought, oh, the title spoils it, <laughs> but it doesn't. Yeah. It's a really, really weird movie, kind of in the in the vein of Phantasm, but even more bizarre. There's like alternate realities and oh, that sounds it's just, cool. It's hard to it's hard to explain, but it's kind of a neat, crazy kind of a movie. 
I'm 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 nuts about like weird weird films, especially like weird obscure films. Um, I actually have this idea to start a YouTube channel where I could just review like some of these cult obscure cult movies. Um, I haven't really gotten around to it, but I, it's something I really would like to do. There's some so many weird movies out there. Like there's one really obscure film with Udo Kier, which is called. Uh, it's called A Hundred Years of Hitler. And it's a movie where Udo Kier plays Hitler in the bunker, the last hour uh, that Hitler spent in the bunker. And it was a movie done as a guerrilla kind, guerrilla movie-making thing, where it's like they just the director just got a, a, a very short number of actors, and they locked themselves up in a house, and they basically shot the whole movie in like a few hours. And that was it. You know, it's almost completely improvised, and it's in black and white and stuff. It's just so weird. And I, I guess many people out there don't even know that some of these movies exist. Yeah. Because they're really hard to find. So, but yeah, there's so many weird stuff out there. So when you make a when when you do a YouTube channel for something like that, and you're doing and you're reviewing movies, is it okay to show clips of these things? Not really. Uh, so it that, should be okay because there's something called fair use, which yeah, uh, but, yeah but, you can. But YouTube takes away your chance to make that, to do that because they're just going to copyright strike it or just give the, give the the um, monetization. Give the monetization over to some troll who pretends that is a like big the, that pretends like they're the rights holder. Yeah, or the actual rights holder. Um, yeah. there there's something going on about that. Yeah, that's true. And a lot of people who do movie reviews, they have to deal with copyright strikes or, or co you know, companies saying, hey, you know, this is our content that you're putting in there and because they have these automated filters. And uh, the, the big studios have this um, database that they can just provide to YouTube. And then the YouTube algorithm kind of checks the videos to see if there's any content there that's copyrighted. And, and if it is, it'll it'll just tell you and 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 be like, wait, you know, you got some, you got a piece of a, a movie in your review that belongs to Warner Brothers, so we've canceled your monetization and we're giving the money from your video views to Warner Brothers. Thank God. And then you have they really need it, you know. <laughs> yeah, and then and then you have to like uh, call for like a counter. Uh, a counter uh, review of your video and say this is fair use. And if they fail to do their own counter uh, review, then you get to keep your, your video up again and you oh, get really? the money. Wow. Yeah, usually they don't really contest. And if you contest the claim, most times they won't contest again. So, you know, if because oh. it's all automated and it's, yeah. they don't really have the manpower to keep you know, how many videos are uploaded to YouTube that have copyrighted content? Right. I mean, it's, right. it's, it's, I don't know how many years of footage being uploaded every minute to YouTube. So, well, and, and like I'm on a, a, there's a, I'm on a King Diamond Facebook group, like a King Diamond fan Facebook group. And for a while, I kept on fighting all these people putting up YouTube links to songs. I'm like, don't you people, I mean, you don't support King Diamond. You're always, you know, you watch all your, you listen to all your songs through YouTube. But mm -hmm. it's kind of like it just it just felt like, you know, King Lear fighting the ocean, you know, just it's like this is the this is this is the, the you know, people don't people don't do they really maybe people don't buy CDs anymore. They don't think of buying music in the same way like they they pay for streaming subscriptions and stuff. Yeah, they get like Spotify or something yeah. Yeah. super useful. But if you're in a place that doesn't have Internet, that's it. You can't access your music. Yeah. So. That's why I'm always a big fan of, like, physical copies and stuff. Although, you know, if you're listening on your phone, an app is fine if you have, like, a SIM card and you're getting, like, an unlimited data plan. But, um, yeah, there's nothing like having your own physical copy of it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I but, feel like uh, you know, nowadays there's YouTube music, right? I mean, there's yeah. there's um, music. A lot of artists have albums on YouTube, but they're getting paid for it. Yeah. But, but uh, they're being paid probably pennies. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, to to give you, like, an idea, if you get, like, 10,000 views on a video on YouTube, that might give you about a dollar. Whoa, really? <laughs> yeah. So if you get, like, a million views, you get, like, maybe $10. Yeah. 
of, re- that, of it's, revenue. It's really that bad? Well, there's – man, I mean because there's people yeah. that make a lot of money on YouTube though. Yes, there are, but most of them have what's called a Patreon account, which is kind of like off the books. So it's not getting money through YouTube. They just put their – they oh. just use YouTube as a platform to put their content, but then their subscribers – support them directly I through another think, website how many of these people just sit in front of a webcam and they record a video and then they just cut out stuff so that their face jumps back and forth while they're talking and and you know it's like that's good enough to get like millions of people watching yeah and sometimes they just talk about news and it's like they're not reporters they're not yeah. journalists they're or, just uh or they're just giving talk, their they're just talking about their day like I, I, there's who is it like jenna marbles uh, yeah, that girl with her dog or whatever. Sure. I, yeah, I saw. I've like, watched her videos. I watched like one or two of those, and like, yeah, I mean, she's kind of funny, but I don't know. It, it's right, it, right. there's this whole weird sort of like, it it feels like our world is being replaced. You know, the the actual movies that you know that you go to and see in the theater and stuff are are you know sort of being undermined by this weird sort of video blogger. <clears throat> Maybe I'm just, I, I don't yeah. know if if it's being undermined. I think that it's just a new venue of entertainment that some people are adhering to. That yeah. uh, maybe they don't mean much to us, but yeah. for like millennial culture, they love these people. You know, they just yeah. You know, for example, there's a website called Twitch, and Twitch is basically just people playing games, streaming them live for for yeah. supporters and getting paid for it. So they're just, you know, they, well, let's say you're playing Final Fantasy and you're playing through Final Fantasy like 13 or whatever, and you're streaming through your computer. There's subscribers that get notified that, oh, Ryan is playing Final Fantasy on Twitch right now. Better go go, go see it. Yeah. Yeah. And they just go and see people play. It's called esports now. That's and, the thing. And I can't, I I can't wrap my head around it because I just can't. The idea of making a video that you're not editing, it to me is just crazy. Like I don't want to, I I that's why I don't I don't watch Facebook Live videos. And whenever whenever my friends, first of all, when they do it, I'm suspicious that it's going to be them selling something, uh-huh. you know, like uh, um, Rodan and Fields, which they all get really tired of me posting pictures of Rodan, you know, in their in their comments. Uh-huh. But, <laughs> oh, yeah, the monster. Yeah, the kaiju. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Funny. They're, they're always doing Rodan and Fields or whatever, and it's like, oh, uh-oh, there's a, a Facebook video of somebody's face, like, in the camera. They're, they're probably trying to sell something. Uh, you're talking about sponsored uh, sponsored things that appear on your feed, right? Uh, no, just like your, when your friends do Facebook Live videos. Ah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, do you ever watch those, or do you just scroll past them? I don't think there's many friends in my friend list that actually do love Facebook Live videos. What I do get Facebook Live notifications is for stuff like CNN, NPR, and stuff like that. You know, music. Uh, um, my friend either, list is out of control. I mean, I either I, news or, or 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 artists. You know, I accepted everybody since Facebook started because of my business. You know, when I was a realtor, and and uh, oh, now I have seven hundred friends. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. I think so I may have about half of that. I've been gradually unfollowing all the people who, you know, do, like, political rants and stuff. And right, right. Um, yeah. That makes uh, me mad. It's like, I don't want to look at Facebook and get mad anymore. Sure, sure. Well, that's when you can go and you can relax and listen to a podcast or watch some of the Muppets. Yeah. <laughs> good, good segue. Yes. Um, so, for me... A lot of the movies that I really like are ones that we had on Laserdisc when I was a kid, and one of them was the Muppet movie. And I also watched the Muppet show when it aired originally. Um, mm-hmm. But there was this weird transition, and I don't know. Like for me, when I went from uh, from elementary school to junior high, there was this. Um, I had this really, really bad fear, and, you know, and I had kids telling me, like, hey, I was afraid of, like, having to take showers with other kids, and I was afraid of, like, I people were telling me I was going to get shoved in my locker and get locked in there all day. And Oh, and gosh, who would I, tell you something like that? Yeah, and so I would get, every morning I would get sick, you know. Getting Anxious. Ready, get, yeah, I had anxiety, and I would get really sick getting ready to, to go to school. And so when I would come home, this was, like, for... Six months, every day I watched a Muppet movie after I got home. 
That's awesome. And, and, and I love that movie. I do too. I think that's the it's the best out of all of them. Yeah, I I, I love the Muppets. I think I saw the Muppet Show. Basically, I can't even tell you what was. There's like three universes that mean a lot to me in the Jim Henson like Muppet universe. One of them is the Fraggles and Fraggle yeah. Rock. Yeah, which was underappreciated for the longest time, and you couldn't even find it on DVD, uh, only VHS. I think the and prob- then the problem was that it was on HBO, and so it was like only for me, to me. It seemed like only rich people watched the Fraggle Rock. Oh, okay. I saw it in Portugal, so yeah. um, it was on TV there. And for the longest time, like I said, they didn't have it, and then they started coming out in like DVD. But then it was just these weird compilations, and then they finally started putting out the seasons. Which is great. Now I have yeah. the whole show. Yeah, I mean, but it was Sesame Street, which I also kind of watched when I was a kid, um, and then the Muppet Show. And I think the Muppet Show has always been the most fun to watch. Um, Sesame Street is more for kids. So I, when I got into it, I was already like a little grown up. Uh, so I, you know, I saw it because it was just hey, there's Big Bird. Hey, there's like Muppet stuff and you know like or Bert and Ernie I always like Bert and Ernie uh, those yeah. two guys and uh, but yeah my my big love was Muppet Show and Fraggle Rock but Fraggle Rock always had a very special place in my heart Fraggle Rock is really good I started watching it after Joey was born and I had him watch it for a while I think I did it too young because now he thinks Fraggle Rock is for babies and he won't watch it anymore oh no but I think he doesn't want to watch any TV. He he only has three hours of screen time a week. So when he uses it, he wants to use it on playing his 3DS or Minecraft. Um, three hours of screen time a week? Yeah. Okay, so what does he do with his spare time? Just read and play? Uh, well, there, he doesn't have a whole lot of spare time. I mean, he's, he's in full-day kindergarten, and so when we get home, you know, sometimes he goes to CrossFit. Uh, you know, got to he's got to we got to make dinner. He's got to do his homework, and then he goes. Oh, to that's bed, right. He goes to bed at seven thirty. So, oh my gosh, it looks like he has like a, a full work day. Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, more more okay. than I do. I guess he plays in school. Yeah. I I guess I always you know I always watched a lot of TV even when I was a kid. I mean I I remember. I remember watching TV all the time. But, of course, I always had school, I guess. I came back home, I did my homework, and then I would watch TV. And when before I went to school, uh, before I went to school when I was like five going on six. So that was my first experience. I didn't go to kindergarten or anything like that. So I was just like raised at home by my mom. And I knew how to read, write, and do some basic math by the time I was like five years old. Um, and I went to school and that's where it kind of crystallized the whole notion of reading and writing and making other operations in math apart from like subtraction and addition. But, um, yeah, I watched a lot of TV. I remember sp- staying up late with my parents watching TV before I went to school. Um, and I saw some really weird movies. I remember seeing one of my earliest memories is watching the day the earth stood still. Um, I saw that when I must have been like five years old or something. And uh, really cool movie. Really stuck with me, um, the original black and white movie. You weren't five years old when the Keanu Reeves version of it came out. No, no. <laughs> but I also remember seeing my first 3D movie. This was um, like the Portuguese television did this brief period where they wanted to get into the 3D bandwagon. And they were like, we're going to start doing some experimental emissions where you can watch like movies in 3D. So you had to buy these like special 3D glasses. They were made out of paper and cellophane right? and uh, cardboard and cellophane. They had the little TV logo on it and all. And so you had to like, it was still one of those TVs that you had to open up a little panel in the front and there would be like a little plastic piece and you would stick that in and tune the channels. You know, you tune the channels by sticking this plastic piece into like this brown hole and just like rotating it. I don't, I don't know if that existed in the U.S. That doesn't sound familiar to me at all. Right. We um, had the three D glasses that were like one red lens and one blue lens. Yes, yes, that's the anaglyph three uh, D. Yeah. That's the same thing we had. But for these experimental emissions, you had to retune your TV channel, so you wow. had to do that 
in a way that you would see like this double image with red and blue. And then you'd put on your glasses and you'd watch a movie. And the first movie I ever saw in 3D was The Creature from the Black Lagoon. And it was pretty cool. It worked. It worked really well. I, I remember seeing it and thinking, wow, you can see the background and foreground and you can kind of feel the depth to the image. So that was that was my first experience with 3D. That was the creature from the Black Lagoon. Wow. That's pretty cool. Nowadays, I'm a big Universal Monsters fan. I have like this big box full of like the Invisible Man, Frankenstein, Dracula, the Wolfman, you know, the Mummy. And uh, I really love watching those movies. Hmm. Yeah, I, I know a lot of kids were into those universal monster movies, and I just never never got around to watching them. I just because they're old black and white movies, and it's like the same reason I haven't seen like Gone with the Wind, or, you know. Even though that's not black and white, I guess. But no, that's Technicolor. Yeah, but um, I, I it seemed like in the U.S. Uh, the Wizard of Oz was on TV constantly. Like, at least one time a year, you would be watching The Wizard of Oz. Sure. I have a big DVD pack for, like, the 75th anniversary edition. Came with a bunch of postcards and multiple, like, DVDs and all sorts of behind-the-scenes featurettes and, you know, interviews with, like, some of the little people that were in the Lollipop Guild and... All that stuff. It's, I love that movie. It's really beautiful. Did they talk and about I, that? Where that uh, was it? Was, was that real or was that just a rumor that somebody hung themselves and you could see it in the background? In the, in oh the yeah, no, that's just a rumor. It's not. It's not real. It's okay. just. Uh, it's just a trick of the light. Yeah, that that uh, when uh, Dorothy and the, the 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 squad are going down the yellow brick road. Yeah. It's it's you can see like a dead munchkin hanging from a tree in the background. And uh, now that we have Blu-ray, you can tell that it's not. So, yeah, right, right. Because Blu-ray really, I mean, for a lot of movies that you only saw on VHS or on TV, I mean, the resolution was terrible when you compare it nowadays to yeah. HD. Three and, twenty and, by two hundred. Yeah, and nowadays you see some movies in HD, and you're like, gosh, I can even see like the makeup edges and like the little wires holding this thing up and the miniature, yeah. whatever. And you're like, it kind of it, it kind of takes away some of the magic because now you see the strings and you see the makeup and you see the stuff. And it's like, ah. But at the same time, it's like I've never thought I would see something this clear. It's really amazing. And Netflix has 4K now, so. Oh, my God. Yeah. I can't. I mean, <clears throat> so does it if you don't have a 4K TV, it won't like start because. I have a cap on my internet. I can't imagine like how much it eats to to watch a movie in 4K. Yeah, probably a lot. But uh, for example, I don't know if some provide ISPs or internet service providers. I don't know if some of them will count certain um, apps like Netflix or Spotify towards your uh, your data. You know, because on on mobile, like some of them don't. Yeah. Oh, on mobile, yeah, maybe. Well, actually, my yeah, both my AT and T does, and my uh, GCI is the cable company we have here, which is not a national company; it's just local to Alaska. Oh, I see. But yeah, but they, you know, they ultimately, have a 500 yeah. gigabyte per month plan, and if I go over, they just throttle me down to to where I can't do anything except for maybe check my email. Oh wow, that's horrible. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so. Um, Another thing I didn't have when I was growing up, and I know it was a big thing in America, was having a console, a video game console. So my my only my first video game console that I had was a PlayStation 2. And I didn't really play it that much because I was already, like, in college. And I was like, eh, whatever. I'll just use it to watch DVDs in my, in my campus room. Um, but uh, did you have consoles growing up? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I got an Atari 2600 and my first I had um I had a little black and white TV was my first TV that I got as sort of a hand-me-down from my grandmother and I hooked up the Atari 2600 to that and just had that sort of set up in my closet. That's the best way to play with an an old console, right? I mean, with one of those old-time CRT TVs. I know you can connect it to a, like a modern TV, but it's like you don't really need to. It, it it gives a more nostalgic feeling to play on one of those old like TVs where you like have like a round knob that you can select the channel. <laughs> right. 
I, yeah. Yeah, I don't I I don't have any CRT TVs anymore. I mean, a lot of purists are really like you got to play on that's the way it was meant to be played, but I just don't have the space. You know, it's like if I had a TV, I would want it to be big, you know, and then it would take up a huge amount of space. Oh yeah, you remember those big enormous like wooden boxes that were the the projectors yeah, or whatever? Rear, rear, yeah, rear projection. Yeah, those were enormous and they would take like an entire that that would be bigger than like a fireplace in your living room. Yeah. And and they weighed a lot too. I remember having a, a average size CRT and that thing weighed like uh like 40 pounds. It was super heavy to pick that thing up. I had um so a- after that I think I I upgraded my TV. I think when my parents got a new TV, they put the, their old gigantic Zenith one in my room. Mm-hmm. So then I, I and I got a Nintendo uh, NES, you know, which is all my friends all had, which I had to have one. But then I, my and so my brother got when my brother got a console, they didn't want to give him the same one, so they got him a Sega Master System, which oh, okay. was really not big in the US. Like nobody had heard of it, but was that what in Europe was called the Genesis? No, that's before the Genesis. Okay. Yeah, but um, the Master System, I ended up playing that a lot more, and um, I kind of, I did. I mean, I liked the Nintendo okay, but the Sega, Gen- the Sega Master System, I loved a lot more, and and uh, ended up playing that way more, just hanging out in my brother's room all the time playing games. Did you know that you can plug in a Sega Master System controller onto an Atari 2600 and it works? Yeah, and an Amiga 500 and a Genesis, Sega Genesis. That's nuts. Nowadays, it would all be like proprietary, like, yeah. you know, plugs and stuff like that. It's... Yeah, they, it, they saved money by not, you know, by not creating proprietary connectors. Yeah, and I think nowadays you have pretty much all the consoles out there, right? Uh, Mostly. Yes. Yeah. I well, yes and no. I mean, I have every Sega console except for like the Japanese ones. Like I don't have the, the Famicom, Mark, the Mark One, and the and the Mark Three and the um, SG One Thousand. I don't have those. Um, and I no, I, I what have I got? I don't have a lot of Nintendo consoles. You know, I I have all the Sega consoles up until Sega stopped making consoles, and then when Sega went third party. I started having to buy every console to get Sega games because now they, there's a they small would do exclusives on each console on you know so like oh you got to get an Xbox and a PlayStation 2 and a, and a, um uh Nintendo Wii? uh GameCube I guess it was GameCube yeah. yeah I remember that that didn't stick around for long Yeah it was I thought the GameCube was pretty cool um I liked that one Uh-huh it had the, did you did you get the recent uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild game? No, and I don't have a Nintendo Switch, but that's okay. also available on the Wii U. But nobody's talking about the Wii U version, but it does exist. Um, oh, okay. So it's not entirely dead, the Wii U. Yeah, right. I think that's the very last game for the Wii U is, <coughs> is Breath of the Wild, which kind of like... You know, you see all the hype for for uh, for the Nintendo Switch and Zelda Breath of the Wild, and you're like, well, that's a game that you can play on the Wii U. So mm-hmm. if you break it down and you take away all of the hype and the you know and and all the you know weird stuff about the form factor and the way it's a like a tablet and stuff, what games does it have? You know that are exclusive, and there's like almost nothing, at least right now. Yeah, I think they're just uh, getting started. Yeah. But I saw the other day a picture of someone who kept their Nintendo Switch on the dock most of the time they were playing, and it was already starting to warp. It was, like, wobbly. Oh, gee. And, and I'm like, that's not a good sign. No. Yeah. If it's be- going to warp with the, you know, the, the heat of the console system. And, and re- more recently, like, the Wii uh, was backwards compatible with the GameCube, so you could play GameCube games on the Wii, and the Wii U is backwards compatible with the Wii. But when they made this switch, they're like, they took the, there's no backwards compatibility at all except for just buying downloadable games off of their s- online store. So I don't like that part of it either. Because, you know, I have I have 12 consoles on my in my entertainment center area, and I don't, nice. I don't need something that can only play one type of games. No, sure, I get that. I mean, yeah. 
like my first experience playing games, um, like I said, I didn't have consoles. So what I had was an old 1982 Sinclair computer uh, called the ZX Spectrum 48K. Right, right, yeah. And this thing worked. It was really, really weird for people nowadays, especially if you mention this to a kid. It'll be like, how does that work? It worked with tapes. Yeah. So the game came in a tape, an audio tape, and you had to connect this little uh, tape player you had to connect it to your ZX Spectrum computer, and you had to connect your ZX Spectrum computer to the TV using a coaxial cable. And so um, it, it was hard because if there was something wrong with, like, the tape player or the, the – the, what do you call the place where the tape player – the tape deck reads the tape? It's called, like, the head. Right, yeah, the tape. So, and so there was a little, like, hole in the tape player that you had to, like, twist this little screw to, like, adjust it or something. And if it wasn't properly adjusted, the the sound of the tape going into the computer sometimes would glitch and the game wouldn't load. So it, sometimes it took forever because you had to play the whole tape for the game to load. Yeah. So it was played in real time. Sometimes it took five minutes. Sometimes it took ten minutes. Sometimes games had more than one uh, section that you had to play. Like, for example, if you were playing a game that had multiple levels – if you had to load the next level, you had to start, you know, you had to, the game would stop and say, load the next level on the tape. And you had to pause the game. You had to connect it, you know, play the tape again. It would load the next level. It'd be another five minutes. And then it would say, okay, level complete. And uh, yeah, it was fun. I guess the, the, the lyrics, the, not the lyrics, the graphics were kind of a little better than, uh, than the Atari 5200. But still not as good as, say, like computer games of the time, like PC games. But they were fun. You would play. I still remember the keys. Usually there was uh, direction keys were OPQA. O-P- so it would be QA would be up and down. OP would be left and right, which is kind of oh. counterintuitive nowadays because nowadays you have the WASD, which is much more intuitive. Right. But, yeah, I remember that. that I, I used to play all sorts of games like uh, Attic Attack. And uh, what was the other one? Uh, Green Beret. Uh, it was like a, a game where you had to – platformer game where you had to, like, dodge bullets and stuff. But uh, there was a Batman Spectrum game that I never finished because it was, like, super hard. Uh, it seems like but, most 8-bit eight, eight games, like games on 8-bit computers were super hard. My, yeah. My 8-bit computer was an IBM PC Junior. So okay. My my mom bought that for my dad as a surprise, and he was like really, kind of angry about it because it's like now I can't get the computer that I want. This was a computer that that came out. It was really poorly reviewed, and it was discontinued. And the guy, the guy who invented it, died in a plane crash. So Terrible. There were ports. There was like a joystick port for it, but there were no joystick. There was no joystick that existed. And it had, oh. it had a remote control keyboard that used like eight AA batteries, and if you would get it more than an inch away from the computer, it would just beep at you when you push the buttons. Gosh, you know, kids nowadays have no idea the stuff we had to go through with yeah. old technology. <laughs> and it's it's just evolved so much. It had one twenty eight k of RAM, and if you buy an entire other like CPU and stick it on top with a new a second disk drive and everything, that would mm-hmm. upgrade the RAM to two hundred and fifty six k. Which meant, yeah, the, which meant you had enough RAM to use the mouse on Word and uh, run Word at the same time, like the Word, the mouse driver and Word. Wow. Yeah. Uh, figure, you know, ZX Spectrum 48K had 48K of memory, 48 yeah. kilobytes. Yeah. So you can imagine how how small that was. There was 128. K uh, spectrum as well. It was a little more fancy and stuff. I think now they they did some sort of uh, Indiegogo or Kickstarter where the actual like creator of it, this Sinclair dude, he actually came up with like a modern version of the uh, spectrum that comes you know preloaded with a bunch of stuff. But but you know mo- most of these games are available on emulators, which I guess some people don't like emulators because it's not the same thing. Yeah. But um, but it just it's it's so much uh, more practical nowadays than having to connect a tape deck to a computer and a t- yeah. to a TV and all that. So I know you, you've been working a lot with an Amiga computer. Yeah, and I well, and and what I like one of the things that I like the best about the Amiga is the keyboard and the the, the feel of it. 
um, the, the, the springy feel of it and stuff. And, and yeah, it's a mechanical keyboard, yeah, right? Yeah. So I mean, I don't. You can't emulate that. So from the, I guess from that point of view, I, I I really like that. I mean, it's kind of a in a way sort of a cyborg of of modern technology and and the old because it's got a. Uh, in the expansion port, it's got a, a card that gives it 128 megs of RAM, which is like, you know, this is a machine that maxed out at one megabyte of RAM. And, wow. And, it's and you've got, been using it to, to to transcribe some of our episodes, right? Yeah, yeah. And, it, yeah, just because it, I can type faster on it, you know, yeah. muscle memory or something. And, and it also has SD card readers. So one of them is your boot card, which is like the hard drive. Uh -huh. And and the other one is is a data card, so you can actually transfer files back and forth between your Amiga and and you know modern system if you have a, a a compact flash card reader. I remember playing a couple of games on an Amiga computer. A friend of mine had one, and it had like a floppy disk that you would stick in that would work as like the boot disk. Yeah. And yeah. and then, yeah. And then I played. I guess you remember this old game called Gods, which was about yeah, this. It's yeah. the platformer. This one little guy with a helmet. And he's like going through these temples and collecting keys and hearts and stuff. I really love that game. And another one I played on the Amiga was, uh, it was a, a game that was an arcade game. It was called Pang. It's about a little guy that shoots a harpoon and he blows up these balloons, giant oh, bubbles. Yeah. yeah, I think I've seen that one. Yeah, it used to be a game that was uh, very common in the arcade, uh, you know, arcades and stuff like that. Um, I played that. The graphics were amazing. They were always very good on the Amiga. They were better than a an IBM PC at the time oh, the uh, for sound. some games. And the sound, I mean, yeah, IBM PCs had EGA, which was like 16 color, I think. Yeah, EGA, CGA, then VGA. Yeah, and uh, but the Amiga had 4,096 colors and stereo sound with like RCA, you know, composite outputs for the sound. That you could There's a lot of good soundtracks for Amiga uh, games that were composed by very famous uh, composers. Yeah, yeah, and you could run the, the sound right into your stereo system, which <clears throat> which was way better than, like, the PC speaker, you know. Yeah, time. PC speaker, God. I remember playing Doom so much because after ZX Spectrum, ZX Spectrum got damaged, stopped working, and so for the longest time I didn't really have a lot of uh, ability to play games. And so my parents bought this 486 computer oh. with 4 megabytes of RAM. And you had the PC that, speaker? And the PC speaker. And so, the PC so speaker the is basically just beeps. Yeah, and, and like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the sound that, like, the floppy disk would do sometimes when yeah. it was reading. You know, you remember that? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, playing playing Doom with just beeps and, and sounds like... Yeah. Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. Choo, choo. And it's like, that's not the same yeah. thing as listening to them actually going like, ah. It's really you know? weird how long the hardware manufacturers, I mean, why why did they all think that, that that's what, that was acceptable for sound? It, it's really Well, strange. there was a sound blaster. I mean, there was a sound blaster that yeah, you could you buy. Yeah, but you aftermarket. Yeah, that's true. That, I mean, that why was, did that they was think crappy. that nobody needs sound for video games? Or that, you know, you just, just having some kind of feedback is good enough. It's I think they caught up with that really quickly, though. I think yeah. they did catch up with that really quickly. I mean, nowadays, <clears throat> computers have come such a long way. I mean, like I said, it was a 100-megabyte hard drive on a 4-megabyte of RAM computer that ran at 33 megahertz speed. And nowadays, you have computers with 16 gigabytes of RAM, and yeah. you know they run at 2.33 gigahertz of speed, and, and right. it's just... Ridiculous. Like those yeah. computers. Well, and the, the number of gigahertz has kind of started sliding. You're, they started relaxing on that, and now it's more about how many cores you have and which yeah. type of Intel processor, if it's an i7 or an i5. And... So if you have all the Sega consoles, you must have been a big fan of Sonic, right? No. no. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I think – because I – my friend had uh, Robert. He had a Genesis before the, and I borrowed it. I would borrow it a lot of the time. But he had a Genesis before the. Um, I never wanted to ask my parents for another video game console. I know a lot of kids would every time a new console would come out, they would just get their parents to update them, or they and they would also have the handheld ones. But I always felt like you all, you guys already bought me a console. I'm not going to ask you for a new one. 
So okay. I would just I would just borrow my friend's one, and and he had so I was really into the more arcadey kind of games. But when Sonic the Hedgehog came out, it's like I liked the first level. I thought it looked really good, but I didn't. I never I never finished Sonic games. You know, I get kind of yeah. tired of them after the first couple. Of sure. Games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you keep, you know, you keep going through some sections where it's like, oh no, I lost all my rings, and I keep losing all my rings, and it's uh, you just put it away and you you give up. And I, I love the look of the green hill zone or whatever. You know, the, every game has a green hill zone that's or some similar. You know, and then but one, once you get past that, then they're like you get some platforming thing and or swimming underwater that I don't, you know, I just don't care about as much. What about? Shooting games, first FPS games, uh, first-person shooter. What sort of stuff did you play? Um, Jennifer had a 486 when I met her, uh -huh. so we I played Doom at her house sometimes. Yeah, and on PC it's much better. I remember they they had a, a version for the Super Nintendo, but it was kind of pared down, and the yeah. the sound wasn't as good, and the levels were a little smaller. There, there's a version on the Genesis 32X also of Doom. Oh, okay. And but yeah, I always played it on her 486, Doom and Doom 2, and you know, getting the mods and stuff like that. And and then you know, when we got into college, I, you know, I really liked um, Quake, the first one. I didn't yeah. really I didn't really care as much for the second one, or when they switched it, like Quake 3 Arena was all basically just multiplayer. I didn't really care for that, you know, as much as like I liked the first Quake. The... Uh, to this day, I still have Quake installed in my laptop. Oh, really? Yeah, it's I, installed I love right the, now. The sort of like uh, Lovecraftian, you know, feel to it, and yeah, and, and the sort of and the heavy metal music that would play on it, you know, and I right, and, and right. simple things like the fact that you could jump and look around, which was like an evolution of what you could do on Doom. Yeah, Nine Inch Nails. Uh, Trent Reznor did yeah. some of the sound effects for that, and yeah. some of the set. The soundtrack. So all the boxes of ammunition for the nail gun said NIN on them. Yeah, they have the logo. Yes, <laughs> yeah. that's that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, I think the first one I played was uh, Wolfenstein 3D, which was kind of the precursor to Doom. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. by ID Software. Now it is, of course. I, I can't wait to play that new Doom game that came out. It just looks amazing. Oh, yeah. It, it, has, it, really, it really captures the sort of um, the feel of the, of the first game, the... Um, the adrenaline and stuff. Yeah, it's like I, I have, I have Wolfenstein installed in my laptop. I have the Doom one and two installed in my laptop, and I have oh, Quake. There are games that I sometimes, if you know, I have some free time, I'll just go there and go for a quick level, and you know, or play online. And I have that mod called Brutal Doom, that adds a lot of new guns to Doom and adds a lot of like cool, neat special effects and like blood special effects, and it, it just. It, you should look it up. It's called Brutal Doom. It just looks like Doom, but it adds a lot of different yeah. visual things to it. So it's like you have finishing moves. Like you're killing you're killing a demon and you're punching him. There's a finishing move that you can do where the little sprite will just pick up the demon and smash him like on his knee and break him in two and just oh, like wow. blood spurts everywhere. The, the That's just so much fun. Does, does that. Uh huh. You, they you do get, that. Yeah. You get more health back if you do one of those finishing moves instead of just shooting them until they die. Right. Right. Yeah. That's that's kind of smart because it it puts you um, in the fray. If you want to continue getting more health and ammo, yeah. you have to actually go and kill them instead of just hiding and try to find like power ups. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah. A lot of well, the, the main game that I've been playing a lot recently is um, Fallout Shelter. It's a little. Oh, it started out as a mobile game, but now it's available on Steam, so I play that a lot. I have a little vault with my little dwellers, and, mm. you know, you get... It's kind of a freemium-style game because you get all these little coins for doing things, but obviously it always asks you, do you want to buy more coins? And I'm like, nope, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, right. I've resisted, I've sort of, except for... Well, I guess that's not true. I've, I've played a couple of those freemium games. I played... Um, the Simpsons tapped out for a long time when that first came out. Oh. And now Pokemon Go. Um, I keep going with that because Joey likes it so much. Yeah, so it's still it's still uh, it's still ongoing. The thing where you go out and you find like Pokemon places yeah. on the real world where you can. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you catch them and try to add add them to your Pokédex, which is like people who actually know Pokemon. You you know, I don't know that stuff. I. When that when that show came out, I was living in Japan, but it was it would come on, 
right after kindergarten got out. Mm -hmm. So that told me like, oh, this is a show for little kids. And it sort of this, that one and Dragon Ball Z also came out on like right after kindergarten got out. And so I never got into those shows because I just assumed, oh, these are meant for like toddlers. Right. And they kind of are a little bit. So to me, it's always surprising when I see like adults that are like really nuts about Pokemon. Yeah. (sighs) Oh, I'm sorry. My allergies are acting up. But yeah, I mean, I never got into it either. I got a lot into Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, I, 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 I think I only saw part of one episode in Japan one time, but I've never. Oh my gosh, it. that's huge! That's enormous. Like Dragon Ball is really big. Yeah, well, it's, it was yeah. the same same reason as Pokemon. I just figured it was for toddlers, so I didn't watch it. Uh, no, I would say it's like for like teenagers and young adults. I guess it's it's really fun, and especially now there's a new one uh, playing on the Cartoon Network or uh, Adult Swim or something. I think Toonami. It's on Adult Swim, Toonami. Mm. And they have Dragon Ball Super. It's in, it's the brand new season of Dragon Ball. They just started a new one. It's fun, but, you know, it's kind of formulaic. I mean, it's always like, oh, this guy is going to – villain is going to show up, and then Goku has to fight him, and all his friends are going to fight him first and die, and then Goku has to be the one to beat the villain, and he's going to beat the villain by – training really hard and then he's going to be able to achieve a new super saiyan god like level so he's always leveling up in all these seasons he's always like all of training his, and all just, of his friends know. get killed in every episode no but every season yeah there's a lot of characters who die and then they have to call the dragon with the dragon balls and they have to bring them back to life oh. rescue them from heaven or something it's huh. it's kind of it's kind of hard to explain but yeah there's been a lot of characters who've died multiple times now but they just keep getting resurrected because at the end of the season, they find the Dragon Balls. You have to find all eight Dragon Balls or whatever, and they have to um, – they summon the big dragon. Sounds like a video game. Yeah, they summon the big dragon, and the dragon says, all right, what, what is your wish? You know, you get three wishes, and then they, they're always like, bring back my dead friends. All right. And they're like, yay, we're back. You know, everybody goes to eat some uh, – you know, goes to eat like dumplings and 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 uh, you know, whatever food they eat. Wow! So it's it's fun. It's fun. I like Dragon Ball, but I also like uh, another game I'm big um, on is Skyrim. I like Skyrim a lot. It's actually, kind of an RPG. I've been sort of resistant to open world role playing games like that because of the time suck. But I've actually uh-huh. been playing one right now. I'm playing uh, for the Wii. It's called Xenoblade Chronicles. Okay, I've heard of it. Yeah, it's it's actually really good. Um, the controls sort of work like uh, World of Warcraft, where you've got like all your skills on little buttons up at the top of the screen, and you just sort of uh, arrow over to each one and tap on it. Or I guess maybe with the Wii, you know, moat, you're supposed to point at them. But I don't like I don't like using the pointer. I use a regular controller. Um, I see. But uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty fun. I'm I'm like 42 hours into it already. And my guys are like level 37, I think. Nice. So it's like a sci-fi game. Yeah, sort of. It's it's a really strange story. There's like um, the 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 world is made up of these two god statue things, Bionis and Mechanis, and they're okay. sort of in this battle pose against each other, and and you're like climbing your way through these different uh, levels, trying to get up to the head. Um, I forget why. There's something up there that you need to do. Cool. That sounds really cool. Yeah. And there's two colonies of, of humans, and they keep getting attacked by these robot creatures called the Mechons. So in addition and- to that, you get all these side quests that you have to do. And I was blasting through the main, main quest and ignoring all the side quests because I didn't really uh-huh. take the time to learn how to read all the quests and all that and then i started getting behind and the animals were killing me and i was like oh i probably should go back to the beginning and do all the side quests and work my way back up to where i am now and that's you know i went from like 18 to like 36 doing that and now do you also have like uh, crazy looking swords in this game because usually these japanese games have these like terrible looking swords that look Nothing like they would be a sword in real life. <laughs> it's a, this is like uh, the the main character has this sci-fi sword called the the Monado, and okay. it it, um, it turns in it, it it has this shaft of light that comes out of it, and it 
And it, it's the only thing that can hurt these mechons. So all of your friends that come around with you every time they hit a mechon, they do one point of damage. I thought you were going to say that sword summons the band Menudo. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I haven't heard that name in a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, mean, cool. Like, little change or something? I think Menudo is like a, a dish, uh, a recipe, like something that, uh, yeah, I think that's what it means. Are they still around? I it's can't a soup. imagine. It's I a mean, traditional Mexican soup made with beef stomach tripe in broth oh, with a red chili pepper base. That sounds Actually, awful. That looks delicious. <laughs> <laughs> beef I, I, yeah, I guess in America, you guys don't really eat a lot of organ meat. No. So, uh, like, you know, liver or tripe. Yeah. But in Portugal, those things are actually gourmet culinary delicacies. Mm. You know, sweet meats, stuff like that. All right. What about? Uh, I guess there's one more one more item we can talk about, which is basically literature, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I my focus has been on Clive Barker for so long. I don't have a huge amount of authors that I that I've read in addition, but um, I really like. Yeah. He's a really underrated author. Than his books, you know. Actually, he was with St. Martin's Press, you know, when I when I first started reading his hardcovers. But Christopher Hins. Uh, he did the Le- the the Paratwa trilogy, which is like Liege Killer, Ashok, and Paratwa. Um, they're about uh, these aliens that that uh, have sort of insinuated themselves into into our world, and and um, but we don't know it. And there are there are uh, creatures that are like two people with one sh- one shared brain. They're the Paratwa. are they the Ashok? Yeah, the Ashok are like the royal caste of the Paratwa. So they they live longer than regular humans. They'll live like hundreds of years. Are they humanoid? Uh yeah, yeah, they're they are. Okay. Cool. I I mean, I got kind of the same thing, kind of the same position you're in. I mean, I've I can't remember a time when I wasn't reading something or watching a movie that was connected to Clyde Barker. Um uh, I mean, obviously, I can remember some things, but uh, let's see. What sort of stuff did I like before? I guess, um, hmm. Well, I, I'm I'm big into, like, Dune. Uh, oh, yeah, I love You know, I Frank love... Herbert's Frank yeah. Herbert's Dune, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft stories, Edgar Allan Poe stuff. Yeah. Um, a Victorian, Victorian age fiction, like um, Henry James, uh M.R. James, Ghost Stories. Turning um, of the Screw. and the Turning of the Screw, yeah. Portrait of, yeah. yeah, Portrait of a Lady, uh, The Ambassadors, and stuff like that. Um, but that's more like stuff that nowadays people would find a little boring. And I kind of read it while I was learning English, and I was kind of just forcing myself to go through this like advanced like literature stuff that I could – you know, improve my vocabulary and all that. So I, I have trouble reading epistolary novels, the ones that are like, uh, you know, letters, you know, like Dracula. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure, I, Dracula is written like that. I like um, I like dialogue, and, I, and so I have, I have difficulty reading stuff that's written in first person. Mm-hmm. And what else do I have? Um, well, I like Philip K. Dick. I've read a oh, lot yeah, of his yeah. books. I've read a lot of his books. I, I've um, only read Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? But I took a science fiction class in college, and that was the one that we read, you know, uh, to compare yeah. it to, to Blade Runner, obviously. And There was this little sci-fi paperback collection in Portugal where they post a lot of, like, well-known sci-fi authors. And they're these tiny little books. Um, it's called Nebula Collection. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I would buy some of these every once in a while. And, uh, usually I would buy all of the ones that had Philip K. Dick. So I've read maybe like a dozen or more of his books that way. Um, translated in Portuguese. But then once I started reading more in English, nowadays I think I have much, many more books that are written in English than they're in Portuguese. Because I just kind of, I always prefer to read the original version of things. Because once I was reading this book, um, because I'm also a big fan of uh, uh, Douglas Adams and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I remember reading a a translated version of the first book 
the his Shackers Guide to the Galaxy. I bet the humor Where, wouldn't translate very well. It doesn't really translate very well, and I, the translator did some really weird things. Like, I thought, this is a bad translation. Ford Prefect, the character, he turned, he changed the name of the character. He called it Johnny Volkswagen. Whoa. And I have, yeah, and I have no idea why the translator would do that. And I was like, that's horrible. He changed the name of the character. And, and, is it and I just there thought. There weren't any Fords in Europe? No, there are Fords, which doesn't make any sense. Why he, he? I guess he just decided to to change it for like whatever godforsaken reason. Yeah. And I was Johnny like, that, Volkswagen. that's Volkswagen. <laughs> yeah, Johnny Volkswagen. That's the name of Ford Prefect in this one book that I bought from this really bad translation of it. And I was like, that sucks. I'm gonna I'm gonna buy the book in English. And I ended up buying the book uh, that had all the first three books or four books or something uh, in office. English what authors think about that kind of stuff when they see that, you know, do, uh, do they even, maybe they don't even take the time to, to, to skim through these books when they come out. Cause like you go to Clive Barker's studio, right. And he's got, he'll have like three copies of each translation of each of his books in that big library. But you yeah. kind of wonder like, does he scan through those and go, what are you doing calling uh cabal like Fred or whatever? <laughs> Well, first of all, you'd have to be able to read them, um, yeah. and I'm sh I'm not I don't know if Clyde Barker knows any other languages like German or French. I'm sure he knows French, but maybe not German. I don't know. Yeah. Or Italian. So sometimes I guess he just gets them and puts them on the shelf and forgets about them. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe so. Um, but yeah. Also, yeah. Big. I was a big Edgar Allan Poe fan. I got this one big book once that had all of Edgar Allan Poe's stories. That's what I have too. Yeah. The, yeah. The complete and I just. Edgar I just love reading all that stuff. And I liked it, but I didn't like reading the poems. Like Tamerlane just bored me to tears. Yeah, there's some poems that are a little more boring. Yeah. And there's certain things that Edgar Allan Poe wrote that people aren't that aware of. There's this one essay that he wrote. It's really big called Eureka. Mm -hmm. It's just basically a scientific essay that he wrote once talking about philosophy of science and stuff. But uh, I also like Edgar Rice Burroughs. I have the entire Mars trilogy. Oh, wow. I like... Um... I've, do you know Roger Zelazny? I think I've read a book that he co-wrote with Philip K. Dick. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I like him. He's he's pretty prolific, but his books have gotten so far out of print now. I mean, it's like it'd be kind of nice if people would go back and reprint them. But like Creatures of Light and Darkness, I really liked. It's a he he took a lot of mythological gods and characters and made them you know made them real characters in his stories. In, yeah. in kind of in a similar way to Neil Gaiman, but you know, predating what Neil Gaiman did. I got into a lot of science fiction for a while. I, I was really a big science fiction fan, but I would get mostly, you know, those anthologies that have a lot of like like Isaac Asimov as oh, a story and, then, and stuff. Yeah. yeah, just short stories. They have a lot of different authors. I like anthologies because they you can discover a lot of cool stuff just by yeah. reading an anthology because you go like, Oh, I like this author. I want to read more about him and that's kind of how i got into some of these uh, other authors that i read but uh yeah i there's you know isaac asimov really big uh and uh i also like peter atkins of course peter atkins is a very accomplished author uh he wrote uh the scripts for hellraiser one no two three and four i think so and he also wrote wishmaster but apart right. from that he also wrote a lot of books I should yeah I should get into uh, I should get into reading some of those. Yeah, there's like a really cool one about vampires called Morning Star. Uh, that I love that one. That's really good. Uh, they, he has another one called Moon Town that I also have, and he has all these like short stories and and the stuff that he wrote. So uh, I have the li the last one I have here to see is um, a book that I bought recently from Peter Atkins. That's. Uh, Rumors of the Marvelous, and it's an anthology as well. Oh, wow. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I like. And, and Hunter S. Thompson, a lot of counterculture stuff. I have uh, Hunter S. Thompson. I have uh, some of his books. Oh, wow. I have a lot of comic books, but also a lot of Alan Moore, because he also wrote a couple of novels. Uh, Voice of Fire It's a really awesome one. I, I never got into comics too much. I mean, I had some Daredevil uh, I was really into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, back before the TV show came out. Uh, sure. So I still have those. I've actually been thinking of selling them. 
Um, but uh, what else? And I like the Sandman, although I've never read all of them. I mean, I, I keep buying these collected books, and then they change the, you know, and then you go to the store, and they don't have one of the volumes that you need. And I don't know, if just for some reason. And then, it, then so much time goes by that I forget, and I think, oh, I should probably start over. Yeah, I, I like Sandman, too. I've read a few of those collected uh, paperbacks, uh, yeah. trade paperbacks. I, yeah, it's really good. I always... I think that uh, Vertigo from DC always had a lot of cool, cool yeah. s- series that they had. But I was always more of a Marvel kind of guy. So ever since I was a kid, I mean, I remember being – before I went to school, I was reading Marvel comic books. You know, Captain America, Spider-Man, The Hulk. All my friends you know, were lit, read Marvel stuff, and I had did some. I mean, I mostly Daredevil, but – but uh, yeah, my my friends hated DC. They always called it dog crap comics. Oh God, no! I actually <laughs> liked uh, some of the co- Superman and Batman. I have a lot of those. Oh, I never never had any DC. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's. I guess it was kind of a like a. A rivalry. Rivalry, yeah, a rivalry. I remember that. And back in the nineties, I mean, there was this magazine I used to read that was awesome. It was called Wizard. Mm-hmm. There, yeah. there were two big magazines that talked about comics. One of them was Wizard. The other was Heroes, Heroes Illustrated or something. Mm-hmm. And I, they would show up and ported in my hometown, and I would buy those. And I, I love – I miss the, those magazines. They were really awesome. I think the problem that I had with comic books is that you could never – you could never afford to get the whole lineup or the whole story of anything. Well, just that happened you, more like, in the '90s when yeah. they started doing crossovers, and, and crossovers yeah. became well, even the that, norm. Like you start, you start buying uh, Daredevil or X Men or whatever. You're buying number like 378. Sure. And so you're like, well, what happened? What happened in all these earlier ones? I mean, if later on they started collecting them in graphic novels because they knew nobody could afford to buy Spider Man number one or whatever. But sure. But I, it just it was too intimidating for me, and everything crossed over each other, and it was all one big universe. And they, exp- I mean, you nobody can buy all that stuff. No, and but I mean, uh, but it, you could subscribe to like a Spider Man comic, and in the early '90s and late '80s. They were still pretty much self-contained, and some of the stories would have a beginning and an end on each issue, yeah. which was fun. So it didn't really matter that you didn't have, like, the previous 180 comics or 200. You could just buy a comic book with a Spider-Man story, read it, and be like, hey, this was, this was cool. Spidey, all right, I'm going to buy the next one next month. It, it mattered to me, I guess. I don't but know. then, you know, they started doing these these crossovers in the 90s where it's like, Oh, and now there's like four titles of Spider-Man. There was the Amazing Spider-Man. There was a Spectacular Spider-Man. There was Peter Parker, Spider-Man, and there was just Spider-Man. There were like yeah. four yeah. titles. Well, and, and they decided that was in '99. Oh yeah, that too. Yeah. And they decided to let's make a story that every single part of the story takes place on every single Spider-Man ongoing series. And people will have to buy all four of those every month yeah. so they can read the whole story. And I think to me that's when I just started getting really disappointed with it because I was like – I was subscribing to yeah. Spider-Man, the, the self-contained title. What at the time – I remember the first issue. They said something like, this is going to be always a self-contained thing. It will be just a bunch of miniseries, miniseries like stories, and you won't have to buy any of the other comic books. So if you want to start over – it was a Todd McFarlane comic book when it came out. Yeah. And I, I started cop, uh, collecting it and subscribed to it, and I would receive it from, you know, in my mailbox every month. And then all of a sudden I started getting stories that were just parts of stories. And I was like, oh, okay, well, this sucks. Now I have to get Spectacular Spider-Man and Amazing Spider-Man. And I just kind of – that's when I stopped collecting the, the comic book. They, they pushed oh, – they, it seemed like they pushed too hard and sort of tipped the, you know, tipped the bucket over, you know, for comic books and. Yeah, and and nowadays, you know, a lot of comic books still have those big numbers like Thor number five hundred, but if you notice some of the new comic book uh, publishing companies, they're doing this thing where it's like they start on number one, and then they do a mini series of twelve issues, and that's it, and then they start a number one yeah. again with a different storyline. And it's like, hey, you know, here's another, you know, 
like they did for uh, some Clive Barker comic books like Nightbreed or Hellraiser yeah. on Boom Studios. But uh, yeah, some of them are really cool, though. I mean, I'm a big regular show fan, and there's a regular show comic book. And I always thought the comic book was just as good, if not better, than the TV show, just because of the the way they had these all these different artists and writers come in and create these funny stories and give different takes on the characters, and they would have different, you know, styles of art. Is and I just a, thought that's is that it, a cartoon? It's, yeah, it is a cartoon on Cartoon Network. It just ended. They they had eight seasons. It was really good. Uh, kind of surrealistic in a way, but. Uh, yeah, I'm a big comic book fan. I have about 3,000 comic books. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I've collected a lot. But then I kind of gave up collecting comic books in the 90s because I started having girlfriends. And yeah. that's when I realized, you know what? I'm spending way too much money yeah. in comic books every month. And I don't have any other pocket money to do other stuff. So I need to give something up so I can have more pocket money so I can go out and, you know, go on dates or go to the theater or go see movies or, you know, have... So that's when I kind of decided, you know what, I'm done with comic books. But I still have them, and I still collect them now, you know, sporadically. So, so. are those all still in Portugal also? Yeah, but I have a few shelves full of comics here already. I mean, especially Hellraiser comic books and stuff like that. So... Yeah, yeah I think... You know, and then, of course, Clive Barker Comics has, has kind of taken over for that, and I haven't really been buying much of any other comics since the 90s um <clears throat> other than that i was kind of a fan of apple i think that right now i'm not really i'm not quite as excited about when they come out with new things i mean part of it is i don't have money like in 2012 i had money to buy whenever some new thing would come out but sure. now, now i don't and also i get a little disappointed with when they're pushing some new thing and and like taking away the lightning or the the head, headphone jack out of the phone i didn't i kind of am wishing that i just let kept my old phone now you know instead of replacing that one well you know i mean who knows what this the future standards are going to be like maybe the lightning jack will become the norm uh, at some point like apple was one of the first companies to do away with the uh, usb port right or the first companies to to uh, to take take it on, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was so. invented by Intel with like a consortium of other other companies, but but it's pe Apple adopted it so early that sometimes people think that Apple invented USB, and they they abandoned like when Steve Jobs came back, they abandoned all of their proprietary ports, like they had ADB for mouse and keyboard, and they had they had a proprietary port for the monitors, which was crazy, you know, and then. Steve Jobs said, get rid of all that crap. Just use USB, which was like, mm -hmm. everybody's like, nobody uses USB. And he's like, you, you can do any, you can have to, up to 250 peripherals on USB. USB, you can chain them together. USB is awesome. Yeah. yeah. I have a giant port here with a lot of plugs going to just one USB port. Yeah. US, USB is still really good. And, and uh, so that was, I think that was a smart move. They got rid of the floppy drive a little early. You know, which people fought against with the uh -huh. IMAX. There were no floppy drive. Um, you remember when there was like a little, uh, what was it called? I even forgot the name of it. But there was a drive that had like a tape um, and it recorded, uh, what was it called? I forgot. It, it was not mini tape or something. But I remember there was, a, for a very short time, I remember my campus computers had these like small um there were, tape drive. A, there were a lot of contenders for um, for replacing the floppy drive. Yeah, yeah, there were, there were, and, and yeah. nothing, nothing ever took its place, right? I mean, even CD drives were like, well, you can't write on these. Yeah. So. It was, well, now you can, obviously, sure. Right, right, but at the time, you, you know, they, it was too expensive. Yeah, but um, gosh, yeah, there were. I remember super drives and zip drives. And there were, like, super disks, which were, like, floppy disks that could hold, like, five megabytes or something instead of one. Sure. And, uh, or 20 megabytes or something like that. I can't... I remember my first USB pen that I used to take to, to college to uh, bring Word files in there. It was a 16 megabyte one. Oh, I mean, wow. can you believe that? Nowadays, I have a 16 gigabyte one. Yeah. So... 
right? that just you increased can even by get like, like a 256 gigabyte SD card, like something yeah. that can fit in the palm of your hand. Mm -hmm. That's nuts yeah. because those cards are very prone to failure down the line oh, are because they? they're always being rewritten and stuff. Oh. And so if that happens, you lose 256 gigabytes of stuff. Right. It's not that's, fun. Yeah. yeah. That, that's one of the things about storage that, I, I mean, I've, I've lost a lot of stuff when I had, like, uh, external hard drives, 500 megabytes, one gigabyte, you know, now there's, like, one terabyte. Mm -hmm. And if something happens to it or you knock it over or it bangs against the desk and it starts skipping, that's it. You pretty much lost most of the stuff that was in there. I've had to migrate across a lot of different platforms because I started out on IBM, you know, DOS formatted like IBM PC Junior and then went to Amiga. And then when Commodore went bankrupt, I, you know, it's like, well, what do I do? And I thought, well, which platform is the most similar to Workbench? You know, which OS is the most similar to Workbench? And it was, you know, Macintosh. So that's even though it was the 90s and everybody was telling me, don't buy a Macintosh because Apple's about to go bankrupt. You know, and they're going to go out of business. You should get it. You should be getting a PC because that's where all the games are. And and uh, Steve Jobs was in that Next company, right? Yeah, yeah. The, that they made computers, right? Personal computers. Yeah, yeah. we actually in college um, at UA, at University of Alaska Fairbanks, we had a Next lab with Next. Oh, computers cool. In it. They, so I got to play with some of them uh, a couple of times. Were they just like normal PCs or? Uh, they were they they ran an operating system that was the predecessor to Mac OS. Oh, and, I see. Yeah, so so like you would click on a folder and it would like scoot you over to like it would have a, another column and it would scoot you over to the contents of that folder and then you click another folder and it scoot you over to the right to the contents of that. You know. Oh, that of, sounds interesting. Instead of having multiple win, you know, you double click on a folder and it opens up a new window overlapped over the top of the old one, which was yeah. the old Macintosh way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But you you uh, you think of Steve Jobs as kind of a, a almost up there in your pantheon of like heroes and geniuses, just like Clive Barker, right? Uh, a little bit, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I he, he wasn't the nicest person in the world, I guess, but uh, he definitely changed the the face of technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and I I liked I really liked the way he turned Apple around. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. The Apple really did have too many. They had too many machines, and the OS had not advanced very much. And he just like came in and he he made a lot of people angry. Actually, the first Macintosh made people angry. I've got a friend that got really upset about when they abandoned the Apple II. You know, was that the uh, iMac? You remember the iMac, that plastic yeah. thing that came in different colors? Yeah. We had a, a computer lab in our college that had nothing but uh, iMacs. And to be honest, nobody really used them because everybody always went to the uh, the PC lab. Oh, really? be yeah, because first of all, that mouse was not extremely oh, ergonomic. Yeah. The, the puck, yeah. Yeah, it was just like a round, circular, completely circular one with just one button. Mm -hmm. And and people were like, how do I like right-click things? I don't know how to use this. And it's not uh, oh, easy yeah. to, to use it all the time because it's just circular. Yeah. So it didn't adjust to your hands. It was, people that yeah. owned... People that owned Max, the first thing that they did was buy a new mouse. You know, you right. since it was you now it's USB. You you have you can pick from any of the any of the mice available for PCs, which was the first time ever that we could do that. You know, and, and same with printers. You know, you didn't have to buy an Apple printer anymore, which was amazing, as long as they had drivers. We're really geeking out over technology here. Yeah. Well, but I yeah. It it was uh, it was an amazing time for for Apple. I mean, in you view, if you wanted to still use floppy drives, you'd have to buy a a floppy disk drive for ninety dollars or whatever. But um, a USB one. But other than that, I mean, I thought I thought iMacs were pretty neat. I didn't ever own one. I always had towers. Up yeah, until me too. I kept trying to upgrade towers, and two times, like I had a I had a Quicksilver G4 tower, and before that I had a like a six, Mac, Power Mac 6500 250. Both of those I installed some kind of upgrade on them and fried the motherboard. Oh no, that's like, terrible! Like because that's 
the 6500 i put a g3 processor upgrade on it uh huh and that fried the computer and on the uh the quicksilver one it was just it was a, just a card that had firewire ports in it uh huh it's just a pci pc card you know like our pci or whatever you call it that plugs into the back and i plugged that in and turned it on and it fried the computer and so Damn. after that i said i am never buying another um another desktop computer again i don't care about upgrading anymore i don't you know i don't care about Sure. I mean, I, I, just before we started this episode, I was going through some computer uh, problems here with my laptop because, uh, of course, the new Windows 10 creators update showed up and said, oh, we, we're going to do an update of your system. Uh, we'll let you know so you can save your files and stuff. But it's basically Windows 10 doesn't let you forego any updates anymore. Wow. You can just delay them, but eventually you'll have to install them unless you use this special tool that makes you delete some updates from the the list of updates but anyway so it did that and then all of a sudden i was trying to open up skype and other things and it was saying oh you can't open these on a built-in administrator account anymore um you have to create a new account and i'm like why and so it just changed a few things and right now i'm not even recording this because my recorder for some reason stopped working with skype after i did the upgrade again and I just have a lot, a lot of stuff to so, fix. So their so. philosophy is that the administrator only goes in and fixes things, and then the regular users or the people who have access to actually using programs. Yeah, it's it's more like the user account control. It's something that Microsoft created in a way to uh, prevent people from doing things to their computers, By just accident. clicking buttons, you know, like just by clicking OK or Yes on everything, and then just ending up doing something bad. So this is like a built-in failsafe where the user account control pops up and says, oh, are you sure you want to do that? Uh, you have to put in your administrator account. That, that's, and a, that's a mistake to do that. I mean, it's okay to do that kind of stuff as long as you can turn it off. You know, right, right. As long as you can say, hey, I know what I'm doing. If, you know, just, I'm, you know, if I, if I screw this up, that's fine. Just let me be the administrator and let me just. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, there are ways of turning it off, but you have to go, reg you know, edit the registry of this, the, the, wow. the Windows software and stuff. So it's like, uh, I'll do that later. You can so still for now, edit the registry in the in the system. Yeah. Yeah. You can still do that. Yeah. It's always been there for every single Windows. So yeah. You can still yeah. I just, I, well, I'm surprised that they still have that stuff as the backbone. Yeah. You still you can still do that. You can still do the command prompt. You know, it's not DOS anymore, but you can still come up with a little DOS-like command prompt. Anyway, huh. um, all right. Well, this was this was a cool, uh, yeah, no Clive Barker episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hope. I know we got a little lost in some technology stuff, but I hope that it was entertaining. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. It's kind of you know we're we're uh, we've been putting off because of some scheduling issues. We've been putting off doing our our commentary for. Um, for Hellraiser uh, Bloodline, but um, I thought this was kind of a neat idea, and and I I think you know inspired by Clive Barker's A to Z of horror, which we're still going to get back to next week. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, it's you know t talking about like H.R. Giger and aliens and stuff, you know, and Halloween made me kind of made got me thinking about yeah, we never really we don't really get to talk very much about what we're fans of, so that was kind of neat. That was kind of neat. We also have uh, on our notes here, you have some podcasts listed down. Yeah. Uh, so I, I actually just listed all of the podcasts that I listened to, um, mm -hmm. you know, for various reasons. Stuff about Sega, stuff, stuff about Apple, um, uh, stuff about podcasting in general. Uh, I just started listening to Postmortem with Mick Garris. And I don't know, okay. Mick Garris, if you're listening to us or not, but there's there's a one thing that bugs me about your podcast, and I wish you would change it. He says at the beginning he that he you know he interviews people, and he says right at the beginning I get them to spill their guts literally. Uh -huh. I'm like, oh no, you don't. You, you can't say that unless their actual guts are spilling out of their stomach cavity. I know it's not literal, right? Yeah, exactly. That's not it's not literally. I've never heard any evidence on any. I've listened to all of his episodes so far, and I've not heard any evidence of anybody's guts coming out of their. So, Mick Garris, you better go pick up a dictionary and learn what literal means. <laughs> yeah, right. 
But other, yeah, but it's it's a great uh, a great podcast, and he's he's had some some neat guests on there so far. Nice, nice. I know that there's some cool uh, cool podcasts out there. I I listen to a few. I listen to uh well, I listen to a lot of NPR uh, for starters. Oh, okay. Yeah, I listen to a lot of that and uh, uh, This American Life. I list I listened to this interesting podcast recently that only went for like six episodes called Missing Richard Simmons. It right, was a very right. strange, very strange podcast about what's going on with Richard Simmons because one day he just stopped showing up to his little gym in you know L.A. He stopped talking to his friends. He stopped answering calls, and he just went in this house and he just never saw anybody ever again, except for just a few very close people. And so this was a podcast trying to figure out what was going on with Richard Simmons, and I think. It's 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 there's definitely a mystery there of some sort, but uh, ultimately what it came down to was just them saying, well, maybe he just has enough, you know, maybe he just doesn't want to, you know, uh, talk to people anymore. Maybe he was just giving too much of his time to people, and he just decided that it was enough. Wow, um, that happens a lot, I guess. I mean, there's a, some celebrities become almost like recluse, uh, never leave their house and stuff, and it's and he's a guy you know, that didn't seem to age. You know, and I, and you kind of wonder. I wonder if age is starting to catch up with him, and he's getting depressed. Sure. Yeah, I think that's really like a lot of celebrities that end up closing their house, yeah. just not communicating, not going out. A lot of those people are people who are, you know, they, they're in a comfortable position where they can just afford to not be entertainers anymore, or not perform, or not yeah. create anymore, and they just feel like, all right, I'm living here in L.A. in my little mansion. I'm uh, I'm okay. I'm good. Yeah, and, it's, if, and if I'm not making a show or a movie or whatever, why do I need to go out and talk to everybody and promote something that doesn't exist? Yeah, and I guess that's true for a lot of celebrities, and it's their right. I mean, it's their. Mm-hmm. But it's just that also they need to understand that when they have fans, and and fans not just in America but around the world, that people will miss you. Yeah. People will miss you, and and they will miss the interaction that you used to offer them, and. You know, I guess they're not trying to be mean or trying to control your life. They just, you know, they just miss you. <laughs> that, that's the thing about podcasts, too. Because if you, sub- if you subscribe to a lot, you start seeing a thing that they call pod fading. Where, like, somebody, you know, maybe it's two weeks between episodes. And then maybe it's a month between episodes. And then they make one in three months. And then they just... Oh, yeah. And then you don't know, like, should I keep this subscription on my list? Are these guys gone forever? What's going on? And the the reality is, all these podcasts I listen to, I don't go to their websites, you know? I mean, it, I hope that people come to our website sometimes or visit us on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Absolutely. We have but, great content there. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, in reality, I don't, you know, I don't know what happens to these people. They just disappear. You know, there's a bunch of podcasts that I listen to, like yeah, the Hellraiser podcast. What happened to those guys? You know, and... They, when I first when 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 I first had the idea for this podcast, I thought I I searched and like oh they're the only ones and they had just started, they're the only ones similar to what we're doing, and you know and I I liked having another one to listen to you know to sort of bounce off of and and see what they're doing and and you know they they it's been over a year since they've had an episode now. That's right. I think their last episode was a Hell World commentary. Yeah. Yeah. On September of 2016, and I, I do miss them. I do miss them too because I, 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 I love their show, and we were lucky enough to be in one of their episodes once, and they were in one of ours. Yeah. So it was it was so much fun. I guess that happens when you're talking about a subject that is a niche subject. Yeah, theirs and, was even more niche than ours, you know. And, yeah. And, and we're we're really niche, so yeah, we're never going to yeah. get probably more than a couple of thousand downloads. I mean, unless. Unless more people in general just start listening to podcasts. Because I think, you know, it, like Clive Barker's Facebook page has like 40,000 views or so, 40,000 subscribers or something like that, right? Yeah, which is insane to me so because... If you take whatever percentage of those people listen to podcasts, that's probably what we have. Right. Yeah. And it's just insane to me that Clive Barker doesn't have like millions of, of followers on Facebook because... Yeah. I mean, gosh, look at look at someone like George Takei. All he does is post memes all day, and you links know, to, and links to to these horrible like 
clickbait websites that have right. pop And I love George Takei. Don't get me wrong, but it's like I don't follow him, and I don't have him on my Facebook I list this, because I, I just had to stop uh, following because of you know you click something and you get like pop up ads and you know I just yeah. I just thought so many of my friends kept resharing his stuff that I felt like I can give up following George Takei and I'll still see his stuff being shared by my friends. Yeah. So that's fine with me. But uh, yeah, I, I think I remember a time when podcasts, people didn't even know what they were. Yeah. And then podcasts, I, I began listening to them when radio stations started putting some of their shows as podcasts available to listen to, not just on the air, but also you can go there and download it and listen to the show. And then I just started looking for other podcasts that were made by private people. And that's when I found, like, a lot of interesting ones. There's one about cinema that I love to listen to. It's called um, You Must Remember This. It's a Karina Longworth podcast. And she talks about, um, you know, the stories and, and forgotten histories of Hollywood's first century. So she talks about, like, Grace Kelly, Jane Mansfield, Marilyn Monroe, you know, uh, the, the the whole blacklist thing that happened during the McCarthy era, oh. uh, you know, the Three Stooges, MGM stories, like talking about, uh, you know, uh, Louis B. Mayer and Irving Thalberg, and they were two CEOs of, of MGM, and how the MGM ended up, you know, st stopped being like a, a movie studio and just became like... Uh, conglomerate of companies and stuff and uh, it, it's just really cool it's called you must remember this it's on google play and all those places that you can find you know all those podcatchers and another another one that i like is one that i got into recently just a few months ago i started listening to this one and it was the wtf podcast with mark Marin. Oh, I, I keep I bringing this that, up i've never seen it and there's some really good episodes because he he does these interviews that are really in-depth. He starts like, well, okay, so where did you go to school and what did your parents do? And these, these famous people will just talk about their lives and their careers, and he goes through every single step. In a way, kind of like what we did when we had some of the uh, actors in our podcast. Yeah. Like, like especially like Nicholas Vince and stuff. We were asking them, so what, and, yeah. where did you go to school and how did you meet Clive Barker and, you know, yeah. what was your career like and, you know, stuff like that. And. But this guy really does a good job with these interviews. He even interviewed Obama. It was, um, wow. yeah, he did, he did an interview with Obama once. He went to this guy's garage with the Secret Service and he did an interview, which I think is pretty amazing that President of the United States did an interview on a podcast for like a random guy. That is cool. Um, that's very cool. So those are kind of like the ones I like. And then there's, of course, the Hellraiser podcast. Uh, I'm still waiting for their new episode yeah right but uh yeah a lot of a lot of cool stuff i don't really listen to a lot of them and some of them that i used to listen to don't exist anymore like you said some of them just fade out so um when i started making my first podcast was ask emmett the crab and and episode number one was audio and i started thinking you know what this doesn't really get, being an audio podcast doesn't really make any sense for this crab character that i have so I got into, I started watching YouTube videos on how to make puppets, and I created a puppet version, and I decided to make it a, a video podcast instead. And I was having problems with YouTube uh, cutting out sections of my video. Like if I would fade to black or something, it would cut sections okay. out, out because it thought that there was like stuff missing. or I don't know what it was, but it was really getting on my nerves. I was like, I'm going to switch this to Apple podcast instead probably uh, early early youtube days when youtube was still a little glitchy and and they had a 10 minute cutoff and sometimes if i had an episode that was 12 minutes i'm like what do i do you know oh what, man i remember that what yeah do I have to cut out here you know and and so i got i i just that's when i started that's when i found vimeo and started using them instead and <coughs> and i also I had iWeb, which was like this Apple web developer program that you could just drag a video into a blog post, and it would automatically push it out into your into your iTunes um, podcast feed. Well, that's which, really useful. That's convenient. How, and that's how our this podcast started out was on that. And I really panicked when when Apple stopped supporting iWeb. I'm like, what do I do now? I don't know anything about how to make, how to make a podcast without dragging the thing over into the website 
Right. That's and is that she, when you got into Libsyn? Uh, that was when I got into Podomatic because I saw some okay. YouTube video guy that said like some little kid <coughs> that was like, "Hey, if you want to make a podcast for free, do it on Podomatic," which I didn't know that free meant like free for a little while until you start running into all these roadblocks, like you know. You, sure. Um, we had too many subscribers, and our website would shut down, and <coughs> and um. I remember when we were uh, doing our first few uh, episodes and uh, we were getting like this, not DDoS attack, but it was more like our website was going down, it was crashing, and then yeah. our podcast wasn't showing up because I think there were too many people trying to download it. Yeah, and they they are, they put artificial caps on how many downloads you could have and stuff just so that you would be forced into this, um, into the, this pay model where it's like, Okay, now you have more. Um, now you have more bandwidth, but you can you only have fifty gigabytes, you know, or whatever. Right. And and uh, so then we would hit the li- the limit on gigabytes. Like, okay, we need to update our plan again. And so those things just started freaking me out after a while. And it was like we had to, we have to do fundraisers. How are we going to keep up with this? Right. And nowadays it costs <laughs> us uh, a little over five hundred dollars a year to keep. Just yeah. to keep our website and podcast running, so that's why we we did the Kickstarter and uh, yeah. it worked. You know, yeah. thank you to all the people who you know supported us because you guys keep us on the air. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's been it's been really actually been really nice, and and the fundraisers have been have been fun to do, and people get something you know besides just listening to us. They they usually get something else for their money too. I know you listen to a few other podcasts that uh, actually I feel like I should get into some of these. Um, For example, when we started the March Madness bracket system for Duels of Blood, you kind of got a little bit of inspiration from the Muppet cast, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's another one that's sort of pod faded. Like he does an episode every three months or four months now. But Mm -hmm. they do do a a Muppet Madness tournament, which, you know, where they pit these Muppet characters against each other. It's kind of similar to our Duels of Blood. Um, which, you know, which is where I got the, yeah, it was where I got the idea from and I kind of sprung it on you and Rob pretty suddenly, uh, last year, but I've heard a few, uh, of these podcasts that you like, like this, the retro hour. I've heard of it. I think yeah. I may have listened to an episode of it once. Uh, they're, pretty cool. They, they, they do a really good job and those guys are, are European. So they have this sort of, they, they have this sort of European Amiga focus on retro gaming instead of uh-huh. all, all the other Sega ones that I listen to. I never got into the Nerdist podcast, to be honest. I, I I'm trying to remember why I started listening to that. I can't I can't remember. It was quite a while ago I started listening to it. Uh huh. But well, there's one I listen to a lot. It's called the Clive Barker podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I listen to each episode three times. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Once once live and once while we're while I while editing and then another time. Although I'm about a year behind, but then another time, you know, when I run out of other podcasts to listen to, I listen to our Do you like listening to yourself? Because for me, I I hardly ever listen to the podcast once we're done. Sometimes I like it. And sometimes, you know, when I think an episode is good, I forget that it's me talking. Right. and And I stop getting mad at myself for saying um all the time or... I can't. I can't do that. I, I get a little embarrassed about listening to myself talk. Sometimes I just I find myself like going like, God damn, we're fucking nerds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like why why am I yeah. talking about this one thing for so long? And uh, and then I like all right. Well, you know that's just the name of the game. That's and just how it I'm is. I'm yelling at myself because I couldn't think of a word. You know because I was tired or whatever. I'm yelling at it. It's you know Hellraiser Bloodline yeah. or what you. Yeah. What you it's like oh the killer on Midnight Meat Train. What's his name? And then it's, either me and you will go like ah I forgot. Yeah, and it's like mahogany. Yeah, you. It's idiots. mahogany. Yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. how do you call yourselves the Clive Barker podcast? You know. can't even remember a yeah. character name. Yeah. Or but sometimes yeah. I'm listening. I'm like, Jose, stop telling me I'm spoiling a Magica. Yeah, I know. It's it's been a long time. Like twenty six years. Uh, twenty six years. Ninety one, I think. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah um, and, as well. and there's one that I also want to throw a. a, a uh, a recommendation here. It's uh, the chattering with Nicholas Vince, yeah. uh, friend of the show, Nicholas Vince. He's been on our show like two or three times. He's and, been, uh, and uh, I, he's a great author. There's more of his episodes are on YouTube. And I think he's sort of 
cherry picking the ones that are going in the in the podcast feed. Right. Okay. Yeah. There there's a lot to go. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Go check out uh, Cheddar and Nicholas Vince. He's on iTunes now. So uh, I, I think I was the first guy to to write a review on iTunes, and I. I texted him about it. He was like, "Oh, yes, you are the first one. Thank you so much." I was like, "Oh, so my pleasure." Did he? He didn't see it until you told him about it, right? Because you're using the American. Uh, I'm not sure. I just sent him the link to it, and then he uh, he saw it. That's, so that's the annoying thing is like you know we've done promotions where we tell people to leave us reviews, and then I found out by doing that that every region has its own set of reviews, and it, and. We can't, you know, and it's not easy to find them. So I'd have to have people show proof or do a screenshot or something. Well, wow, I can't believe we've been talking for two and a half hours. Oh, jeez. Okay. Do you want to just tell our listeners what's coming up next on the next episode? Yeah, yeah. So we're we're still planning on doing a Hellraiser uh, Bloodline audio commentary. And, of course, then uh, Clive Barker's A to Z of Horror will be doing the letters... uh, G H and I, I think. That sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah. G H I is the next one. Okay. So, and and then there was another uh, commentary track that you were thinking about swapping out at some point. Yeah. Well, because we have Hellraiser Judgment, you know, in our schedule, it's already come and gone. You know, we were supposed to have already done that, and we can't because the movie does not exist so far. And there's no there's no trailers there's no there's nothing telling us when it's coming out. Yeah. And, so <clears throat> you came up with the idea to maybe uh, replace it until it comes out with uh, Gods and Monsters. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a really probably one of the best, probably the, I guess the best uh, movie that Clive Barker produced that's not an adaptation of one of his stories. Yeah, I agree. So I think that that will be an interesting commentary track to prepare and to listen to because it's it's a good movie. It's not it's not a horror film. It's not it's not a, a you know hell on earth kind of uh, you know a commentary track where we're just torturing ourselves with bad movies like Rawhead Rex. No. So this is going to be interesting, and uh, I, I need to learn more about this movie. But I, I think that will be an interesting commentary track. Well, and I think we'll be caught up with everything Clive Barker, right? I mean, once we do Hellraiser Bloodline, Gods and Monsters, and eventually Hellraiser Judgment. Yes. Then we'll be completely caught up with, you know, unless we want to do, like, Sleepwalkers, because Clive Barker was in it for 30 seconds. or no. Hey, that's that not way. bad. 10 seconds. Yeah, that's not bad. Uh, I like that movie. But there's one that's really obscure. It's called Barn of the Blood Llama. Right, right. I've never seen and- that. And it opens with like a, a llama, a stuffed llama, putting the needle on a record and playing some music, and it's just weird. And there's an opening has Clive Barker reading something, and that's the extent of Clive Barker's appearance on that movie. So I have no idea what was what was that about. Maybe we can one day send that question to Seraphin and see if yeah. Clive can shed some light yeah. on Barn of the Blood Llama. Right. Well, and we do need to come up with some stuff for our book too. Uh, That's true. Questions, you know. I, I'm gonna now that we've got. Oh yeah, we didn't really update on Kickstarter exactly, but we everything's shipped out now, right? Everything except for the the hardcover interview books that we haven't actually. Started. Yes. We need to get started working on those. And you people, you guys out there, will receive your tracking numbers uh, today. I'll I, I'll just send. Uh, I might send them to Ryan, so you can send it to them because okay. I I don't think. I have their their contacts right now, but uh, I'll, I'll send you that after and, this. And today is Thursday, uh, the what is it, thirteenth? Yeah, yeah. Thir- uh, Thursday, the thirteenth of April, two thousand seventeen. So, yep. Yeah. So as we're recording this, you know, it'll probably this is probably going to go live on like over the weekend. Um. But yeah. I hope people find this episode interesting because that's my thing with podcasts is I just like to zone out while I'm doing something repetitive, like cleaning yeah, the house me too. or working in the garage or something. So and, I and hope this – Give us feedback too. We love feedback. So tell us what you think about each episode. I mean clicking the like button on a Facebook post is, is fine you know, and it, it does make us feel good. But I really like hearing what people think. I remember – one time I was listening to the Sega Nerds podcast, and they did an entire episode about a movie that I hadn't seen that was not Sega-related at all, and it made me mad. And I was like, 
this is the first episode of yours I'm not going to listen to. I think they were talking about Batman versus Superman. Oh, I see. They were trying to jump on the bandwagon when that yeah. movie came out. Yeah. Get more they, listeners. They were all excited about it, I guess, and they just wanted to talk about it instead of because there's not Sega's been pretty slow and there's not been a lot of news from them. So I see. I yeah. see. All right. Well, um, give us feedback, even if it's just to say stop talking about yourselves. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I know sometimes we uh, we are more conversational. We don't really have like a, a, a strict uh, written down, no. you know, statement of what we're, you know, when we prepare an episode. We're pretty much just letting it flow and try to segue into the different topics. We have just a list of topics that we yeah. try to adhere to on each episode. But, uh, yeah, just give us give us some feedback. And uh, I hope this episode was interesting for you guys because we were just talking about ourselves personally. And, um uh, and this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. You can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Google Play, and Double Twist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening. I'm earnest. And what is an earnest, you might ask? A man with a past rich in both history and tradition. Should we punish this man for crimes he did not commit? No, 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 no. Can't you speed things up? Okay, okay. Such a man should be set free.